Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are doing something for the first time and I'm Never very excited before about done. It. We're doing a tutorial for a game live. Now historically we would have done this. We'd film it in the studio, we'd edit it, we'd add in the effects. And so we're going to be trying to bring a lot of that to the table here today and it's for one of our, our favorite games at this point, honestly. It's called Sky Tear. It's by a publisher called PvP Geeks out of Italy. And it's made by these two brothers who just... <laughs> They've got the X factor. They you want know? it. Not not every game Passion. does. And this game, and it's obvious they're they're definitely trying to create a product um, or a game, really um, more than a product. It's in fact specifically not a product. It is a product. Life's it has to be a product. Like but um, there's just definitely something more be, be behind this than just trying to create some kind of marketable product in tabletop. So we love this game. It's got an incredible theme. We've been doing a lot of content uh, for a lot of live streams in 2020, if you're watching this in the future. And if you've been watching... COVID-19, yeah. in case you weren't familiar. It would have Real been bummer. Co conveniently named COVID-20. I feel like that's <laughs> what it should have been. Anyways, all that said, uh, this is a game we've been doing a ton of live streams for. And so you've been seeing those live streams, but you don't know how to play, so they're really not of interest to you. This is going to be a great uh, stream for you, because we're going to be going full-on, uh, comprehensive look at the game and how to play. It's worth noting, too, one of our favorite parts of how they're handling this game is that they actually have living rules. So these things change and adjust over time, even since we started playing. Usually back, little tweaks or clarifications. Starting or hand things, size yeah. or minor changes in, like, Frenzy was a type of action in the game that changed a little bit. Uh, but the ultimate thing is they're interested in the long-term health of the game, which I, I totally... I would way rather have over overly quick reactions than slow. We've seen that happen a thousand times. So uh, I recommend checking out the official rules document after you watch this, especially if you're watching it on into the future, because uh, who knows what has been adjusted and changed. Absolutely. So this is a tutorial for anybody who actually wants to learn this game, learn, learn this game. There's some good shorter videos out there that'll give you the overview of kind of how it works. But we're going to be diving into it from top to bottom. And <laughs> if you'll come with me, and Zach will stop dying here on the stream. <laughs> We'll go I ahead was and trying get so hard not to die. I was like, oh, man, we're live. I'm going to cough. Yeah, it's COVID-19. Cough, cough. Oh. So let's talk about Skyjare, <laughs> shall we? Um, this is a game that arises out of a format called MOBA, uh, Multiplayer Online Battle Arena is what that is. This sounds complex immediately. <laughs> it's really not. Uh, you'd be surprised. So I got turned on to this. I was a big Warcraft fan and just Blizzard fan all the way from Warcraft 2 up. Um, and Warcraft 3 came out, and what they did, and they did this in Warcraft 2 as well, a lot of you probably watching are familiar with this, is they had custom maps that people could create, and then they could share them on what was called Battle.net, which was like... And it's like a computer game, right? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a computer yeah. game, video game, uh, called an RTS, so you would control things and build buildings and go fight, build armies and go fight each other. Uh, but what they did is they released like all the map editing tools and all of that to the community, Okay. And then said, you have everything that we used basically to make this game, all of the skins, all of the scripting, everything that you could need. Let's see what you guys make. And so then people made all of these different games using the Warcraft assets. How empowering is that? Isn't that awesome? And then you would go on Battle.net, and then someone would have created a new game, and you would go and you would download their game file. And then you would start the game, and everybody would be playing it with them. Right? That's crazy. And so then I downloaded this person's map. Then I can host that map on Battle.net. And then other people who are new can download it from me. And then we can all play together, right? So this spawned a ton of formats and a ton of games uh, just from the creativity of these communities. Like There was like tag you could play. Like tree tag is what it was called. It was super fun. There was big like almost party games, a game called Pyramid Escape of mini games. I mean, it was insane. Yeah, that's the, awesome. The innovation that happened there. One of the bigger ones was Tower Defense that came out of this, right? And this is now a popular wow. format for mobile Tower games. Defense? And yeah, was yeah, a, yeah, that came out of that. I At had least no idea. that's the first time I ever experienced it. Was on I would be surprised, that right? Because yeah. that, that was what are we in the early two thousands or late nineties with this game? Yes, and there was a bunch. Two thousand three is when Reign of Chaos happened. Um, so there was a bunch of stuff going on, and the biggest one that came out of it was called Dota: Defense of the Ancients, and it was called that, if I remember correctly, because the Ancients was like basically the towers for a faction and they were like the ancient, they were called the ancients literally. So they were big like tree people. And they were kind of the towers and the bases that you had whenever you were playing. So you were trying to defend your ancient against mm. your opponent, right? Nice. And the way that this format worked is you would have uh, these minions, creeps, that would spawn in a base and then they would march towards the enemy base and then they would clash with each other. And the first group, or the first army, that would take out the enemy base is the one that would win. Right? So it started very simple, right? And then 
then we added where it's like, OK, well, now we're going to add a bunch of heroes to this. And so now me as a player, I'm controlling a hero. And my role is to make sure that my minions, my army, does better than my opponent. So I run out into the battlefield, and I kill the minions, or I attack the enemy heroes, or I heal my minions. And I basically have this uh, system where I'm trying to support my troops to get them to the enemy base to destroy it. Tons of spinouts from this. Tons of different formats, different types We've seen of so Dota. so many different games in this format. Oh my gosh, even at Battle.net on that day, like those days, there was different versions. People took it and did different things. People balanced it in different ways, etc. So it became really big, and then it spun out into its own property from Battle.net, and that's where you got like Defense of the Ancients, officially Dota. There's a big trademark battle over whether they could use Dota or not. Valve did that. Mm. There's Dota. There, that's why Heroes of New Earth came up, because it didn't want to use the name. You had League of Legends now, which is one of the big ones. But all of them revolve around this pretty simple concept, right? That you're, you have lanes of combat, you have minions that are running down those lanes, you have heroes that you're controlling that have special abilities, and your role is to support your army in whatever way you can by supporting literally your minions, by being on the offense and attacking enemy heroes, by going to the jungle and leveling up so that you become more powerful than everybody else. Um, there's all these different tactics and that's basically the format. That's what has spawned. And it's got huge in eSports, and I mean, it's like, t it's giant, Just massive. Right? It's massive. Yeah. So what Skyterra is, is basically bringing that concept to the tabletop. And it's a good question to ask, like, well, why would you do that? Why is this format so fun? Is it even, does it even work in a, you know, a non-video game format? Because a lot of games don't. Well, I feel like a lot of games have also borrowed. Like, oh, it's right. sad that they do this, but... Not Did, quite. You see MOBA on the boxes before, and it's like, it's not. I mean, most of the time it's not. But this is actually literally the format. So it's worth asking the question, well, what makes it so good? What makes it worth doing? And there, the number one thing for me is, like, this format captures, it builds into itself a catch-up mechanic. So there, the stress and the, like, the, I guess the flow of the game, as I do better, as I push my army further into your base, it's easier for you to come take me out. I'm more exposed, right? I'm, I'm farther from my like friendly nexus. So basically, you're pushing towards my base, and the, the more you're winning, the closer you're getting to all of my stuff. So it gets easier and easier for me to defend you, because obviously now you're 100%, in my territory. And all of your heroes are now closer to me, and you can, you can swarm me really easy. So there's a natural catch up mechanic where it tends to not get out of control. As I push through to your side, now it's easier for you to push back, and it's this kind of constant tug of war. Um, so you've got that. You've also got all the different heroes being super unique, and there being a lot of them. And so as a player, right, you get to find one to five heroes, usually, that you just love. right? They have the mechanics that you love, or they have the theme that you love, the flavor. So when you go into a game of Dota and you're picking your hero on the screen, right? It's just like, oh, like, like half of them I'm not really interested in, but like sure. these ones I really love. It's like right? choosing a character in like Mortal Kombat or Mario, 100%. Uh, not Smash, Smash Brothers? Smash Brothers 100%. I want to yeah. say Smash Party. <laughs> <laughs> Mario Party and Smash Brothers. Were you guys play any uh, Smash Party? Yeah. Uh, there's also the other thing too in this that's really important is that there's a tactical uh, just buzz to it that's amazing because you're having to coordinate with your team to say like, let's go to this place where we think these heroes are going to be. We can't quite see them yet, but they're pushing this lane. And I think they're gonna be like right here in the lane. So let's just all jump into that lane and try to, what's called ganking. That was called ganking yeah. the hero, which is a card in the game. Uh, and so you have to coordinate with your team and you have to have a lot of teamwork going on and the best teams and the best players of this game, you know, they're all on headsets or they're next to each other and it's like constant communication of where are you, where are you, who's going where, what's gonna happen. So it gets super exciting, super exciting to watch and super exciting to play. But one of the things that I think Skyterra, and Skyterra has all of that, except I'm the person who's controlling the entire team. Unless you're playing, Unless they have you're playing formats to play 2v2, 3v3, 4v4 kind of thing. You can actually get to a point where you're controlling one hero and, and it's like, okay, well now yeah. we've actually done the full format. But one of the things that I really like about Skyterra and its representation of this format as compared to video games is that when I was playing Dota, I wasn't particularly great. I was about a mid-level player. And the reason for that is that I just am not fast enough on a mouse. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I don't have the fastest computer. I don't have a great internet connection. I never have we in We were living life. out in the country when we were kids. And I don't, I mean, I'm just, I'm not as good at clicking on stuff. So 
uh, it's well, that's what's called Twitch, you know, Twitch games, where the faster you are at like in the millisecond managing, you know, where your your movements are going, the better you're going to do. And if you tell me that I can have all the Dota experience that I fell in love with for many years, but I don't have to worry about the like obnoxious clicking speed, yeah, then you've got something. And so I can sit back, I can enjoy myself, I can think about long-term strategy, I can think about the turn that I want to kind of compose, and then I can do it and we can have a beer together and have a good time with it, right? Yeah. So it's less intense, but it still brings the same amount of fulfillment uh, that, the, that the format really is built around. And so it's, uh, it's quite impressive to me, ultimately. And so when we first saw it, it was like, wow, this could absolutely be something. So I do think that SkyTear absolutely embodies this format. So let's zoom into the board and take a look at what the game really looks like. So we're a little bit zoomed in here on the board. We've cut off. There's more board out to the sides. Um, Which you can see in the smaller shot at this point. The tracker goes from 0 to 20 here on these sides. That's your health. And so you'll see that we've cut off a little bit of that so that we can stay a little bit more zoomed in on the action. So if you actually get your board out, right, it's going to be longer and, and you'll see more than what you see here. So let's look at the basics of the game. This is the two-lane uh, map. This is kind of the standard map for normal play. And you can see right off the bat there's a couple of things that make it immediately obvious that this is a Dota or MOBA-based game. We have two lanes here. So we have a lane over on this side, and we have a lane over on this side. And in the middle is a control point. So you see a control point here and a control point here. So those are your two lanes. And so if you imagine, like, if you imagine it in your head like Dota actually is, what the game represents is like your minions spawning, walking out to here, as they always do, you know, clashing with the enemy minions, and then all of this kind of getting pushed one direction or another as things go well or things go poorly for you. And then Zach might come over here and push this back and take out some minions, etc. So there's two lanes of combat that are going on, and that is quintessential for this format. That must be happening for it to be a, a, a MOBA game to me. Um, so these are our lanes. These are our towers. So you'll see we have tower pockets here. Zach's painted his red, which is as you might expect. I painted mine blue. Also, to anybody who knows us very well, is not surprising. And these control points are going to represent how well you're doing in your pushes eventually they're going to knock these towers down and then you're going to roll into my enemy nexus and if this nexus gets destroyed then the game is over right so that's that's the the absolute necessity for me for a moba game to exist you have to have towers you have to have creeps and you have to have pushing going on pushing yeah. is a key strategy in this entire game it's really important so we've got that we've got the lanes we've also got the nexuses that's the enemy base and the the friendly base so that's the objective and then we've also got this area here called the dome, or at least we call it the dome. I think everybody's kind of adopted that Is vernacular. Is it not properly called the dome? Yeah, I think it may be. I don't know. We had some questions about what we should call you know, heroes that specialize in the dome, and it's hilarious, some of the options. <laughs> um, but so this is the, and, and if you're a Dota player, if you're familiar with the format, this kind of represents the jungle in the game. Um, and that's where basically, if you're not involved in the lane to lane combat, you can kind of sneak away and do something of value for your team kind of by yourself. And so what the dome represents is kind of that idea that I can do my own thing that's not necessarily in a lane, but I'm still contributing to the team. And what that manifests in this game is that it actually summons this big monster that then goes and, and messes with the enemy team. And whoever controls the dome gets to use that to their advantage. They yeah. do, yeah. So it, it's a way of like creating that advantage while also bringing back a concept from the game, uh, which was like Roshan, or some some big monster that's, that's present in the game, which is classic for the format as well. So it's kind of all here. And then finally, you have heroes. We've got tons of heroes here, and there's a ton of heroes to choose from. There's four different factions. You can mix and max, fa max factions as you like. And then uh, they spawn around the nexus. So and they respawn. So like just like all of the, if if you played Dota, you played a MOBA game, all of this should look very familiar to you, right? Your heroes spawn here. They go out into the lanes. They fight. They help each other. They try to push into the enemy base. It's pretty much that. And it has. When I first played it, I was like, this is a revelation. It actually is the experience that I've been looking it, for. It somehow encapsulates all the 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 good fundamentals of a MOBA without getting bogged down and like being too too much replicating it right on the table. Yep, yep. Also on the, the hero front, if this is something that interests to you, it definitely was a big component of this for me. 
uh, is there are actually lore books that they're putting out that mm. basically flesh out these characters and give you a background and a history in each of these factions. And each of the four primary factions are based around um, elements, right? So yep. there's like the fire, lava faction, and there's like the earth faction and whatnot. So and the elemental stuff is really cool to me. So lore-wise, theme-wise, even the heroes and the story behind them and what they're doing on the table, uh, definitely bringing that unique, cool hero element. And as a miniatures, you, if you're looking at miniatures and you're immediately nervous, also worth noting that these are all pre-assembled. Pre-assembled, and they're uh, so good. Which which is a huge step. I hate assembling models. So if that's ever something that's kept you out of a game, uh, that, that's not something to keep you out here. Yeah, it's it's pre-assembled models. You can paint them if you want to. We did. We had a community here on the, the live chat helped us paint our models. So everything you see here is done by, more or less done by the community at large. Um, but you can paint the models. You don't necessarily have to. So you can jump right into the game when you get the box. The minions look absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's this weird, it's a hybrid of a board game, because it's literally, it's got a board. Yep. Uh, and it's a beautiful And you can buy space. the core box and then never do anything again and That's play it. it like a board game. Yeah. yeah. And it's a board game that can be one-on-one, -on -one, two on one, two on two, all the way up to 4v4, which is really cool. It'd be a great experience just in that box, yeah. honestly. You've also got miniatures, so it's kind of a miniatures game where you can get your painting on, your hobby uh, thing going on. But then it's also a card game. And that's something we'll get into at the end of this video. And if I were describing it like a like a coffee or a beer, it's like the front note is a card game. Like the, yeah, the heavy yeah, note yeah. is card game. Uh, and so it's really cool. We, we've seen a lot of people getting into it that haven't ever played a miniatures game. And I, I would not define this as a miniatures game. It has positional elements more like, uh, you know, a game like uh, X-Wing or even Monster Apocalypse from way back in the day. Where they're, and that's part of the MOBA thing, right? Yeah. I, I think that's the important thing is not only the lanes, but why the lanes matter is that there needs to be this push and pull of which side of the board to invest in, or the you know the dome as an example, uh, and that tension of where you're placing your heroes, which which heroes are going to which side of the board. So it's strategic in that are you going left, right, or middle? Yeah, which your long term plan choice. Yeah, and it's tactical in that the specific spot you're choosing on the board uh, is really important. And then you lay out your hand, right? And yeah. then the card game is the tag. The zoomed in tactics happen. Absolutely. And then you go back out, right? Yeah. And things that make it, you know, not really a miniatures game for me uh, is there's no measuring, right? We're on a hex board, and you move every. One of the best things about this game, I don't know if you mentioned it later in this, but is how to move. Well, not how to move, <laughs> but is that all of the heroes move three spaces? Ah, so they good. can all see three spaces. They all attack three spaces, and that one it's very streamlined in that way. So, like in a miniatures game, right? It's part of the appeal. It's like every unit, you know, I have a scope on this gun, so Six I can speed, see five further. speed, eight speed, yeah. two speed. Yeah, and it's a lot of floating information to just kind of have to to learn and, and memorize. But that's why I say it's not really a miniatures game. Is that mm -hmm. a lot of outside of having good miniatures that you can paint, it doesn't feel like a miniatures and game. The positioning, at all. yeah, yeah, yeah one hundred percent. So. The, the game is very simple in terms of the way that it flows. So we've got really the meat of the game is in what's called the heroes phase. So the heroes phase is where you are going to activate one of your heroes. It's going to do a couple of actions, three actions, and then you're going to pass, and that's going to exhaust that hero. And back then and it, forth. And then it can't go again, and then it passes back to you, and then it passes back to me and passes back to you. So we do one hero at a time, back and forth. And then once all heroes have exhausted, we go to the end phase where everything ends. Uh, and then in between there, right, right before kind of before the hero's phase, or as the hero phase ends, and before it kind of restarts, we kind of reset the board based on how that turn went. And that's called the minions phase. So the minions phase, that's where we're going to determine who has led their minions basically most effectively. And then we're going to marshal more into the fray. So we're going to bring more minions into the fray. So the way that that's really going to function is we're going to look at these control points. So our minions are kind of going to be huddled over here in this mass on the board. And they're fighting, you know, they're minions, right? They're just like clashing with each other. And these are our control points. And so you see I have a control point here that is one. So this is the first lane. We have control point here that's number two. And then we have kind of a permanent control point here that's number three that always is the dome. And so heroes that are around this control point, so like heroes that are kind of influencing this, are going to contribute points to make you more successful in that lane than you would otherwise be if left to your own devices. So right? their literal presence makes you more successful. Their presence makes you more successful. And certain heroes are better at influencing a lane than others. There are certain actions you can take that are going to make you more effective at that lane. But let's say like we resolve this, and I had more influence by a couple of points. We're going to move this control point closer to you, and then all these minions are then going to snap to that control point, right? So at that point, 
now I have advanced my control point. So when I spawn new minions, they're actually going to come into play closer to Zack's base. So you can see how the pressure of controlling your army and pushing your army towards your opponent is going to continue to mount. Because those minions are now closer. And I probably have more of them. And so if you don't do anything over here, that's going to keep happening That'll over and over problem. and over again. Um, so we rally more minions into combat. That's the next step of that phase. Then we go to the dome and see what happens. Once somebody wins the dome, this big outsider comes into play and kind of tromps around the board and tries to even the score with your opponent. And then we draw some cards. We go back to the heroes phase, and it starts over. Ransom phase. So heroes, minions. Heroes, minions. Reset. End. Yeah. Draw that's your it. cards. Do your stuff. Repeat. So pretty easy, right? I mean, it's a very streamlined phase. Um, so the most important thing of the game, obviously, is how, well, how do we activate a hero? So let's look at that. So we'll set up the board kind of how it how it starts, which is just a couple of minions on each side. Those control points are kind of static along the lines. The outsider hasn't been summoned because the dome isn't in play yet. We haven't had that Good phase. Movies. And we've got some heroes kind of around the nexus, right? Yeah. So the first thing you can do is you can move. Of the actions that you can take, move is one of the ones that is usually going to be really important for you to do. Right? And when a hero actually said they get three actions. They get three actions. So yeah. one of the things you can do is you can move. Yeah, and moving is in like in most uh, kind of any game that involves miniatures is going to be a really important piece of what you're going to be doing, right? So movement is very very simple in the game and you you hinted at it earlier. I don't have a move stat. I don't need to reference how many hexes or how many inches I'm going to move. Every hero moves 3. All right. Simple. Three is an important number. Three hexes. I can move through these white lines. I can go anywhere that I want. I, you know, I can I can resolve that move however I'd like. The only things that you can't do is you can't go through blocking elements, and that's other heroes or towers. So I was, you know, I can't like move through my my tower here. I don't want that. Not that I would ever want to do that. And then if I have a you know a friendly or an enemy hero here, right? I can't kind of move through these guys because they're go they're going to defend their space. Yeah, you can't fly. You can't yeah, jump. I can't high. fly, or at least not yet. Now there may be a hero that comes out at some point that can, but like all flying in all games, it will absolutely ruin the meta. <laughs> um, so we can move. And the other thing you can't do is you can't end a move on something that you can't physically end the the miniature on, right? So like, if I try to do that, I, I physically can't. <laughs> I just can't yeah. put it. So, so I can't end on minions. I can't end on towers. Obviously, I can't end on other heroes. But you can hop over minions. Oh, absolutely. So you can move through the minions. You just can't stop on them. Absolutely. So if I were, this is Ekrit here. This is a, one of my favorite heroes. If I start a move here, and let's say I resolve it, I can go one, two, three, because I can end on that space, right? Makes sense. But I can't do like a one, two, three, because I can't end on a space that physically just will not allow me to do it, right? Yeah. So that's the move. Very easy. If, uh, if you can't place it at the end point, then you probably can't move there, right? Then second thing we can do is we can lead. And we talked about this is an action that actually allows you to better influence your lane. So the lead action is where I take a card from my hand or from the top of my deck. And if it's on the top of your deck, it's random. It's random. I get to, I get to put it underneath my, uh, my hero card. So let's say that I do that. Let's say that I lead here with a little card from the top of my deck. So you might be thinking, OK, well, what's the point of doing that, right? What is the significance of this card? So I'll tell you. So at the end of the heroes phase, when we start seeing who influenced the lane better, one lead card in this lane from my heroes is going to count. And what I do is I count the number of icons in the top left corner of the card. So if I look at Migraine, for instance, which is essentially the random card that I have pulled up here from my deck to uh, basically take a look at these icons. Every card has a mana cost, and you'll see we won't worry about these cards too much yet. But in the top left corner, there are two symbols there. That means I get plus two to my influence value or my lead value for that turn, that me controlling that lane. So it's a way for me to basically take an action to give a rousing speech, you know, or to, to physically empower my minions. It represents that in the game of that's what I'm doing when I'm leading. Now, one of the things that I like to envision is that you basically, you can, you can do this two ways. You're going to have a hand of cards, right? So if you, you know that you need a certain value to like really own that lane, you can put it in there. And that to me is like I'm calculating my battle plan, and I really know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Like, ah, like I'm a tactical master. But I'm losing a card from my hand. And so that means that's a tactic I don't get to use. That's, that's my ability to influence the board in other ways is more limited now. 
But I like to think of leading off the top of my deck as like just rolling in and just being like, hey, let's go, like let's push, like march over there. You know, you don't really have as much of a plan. Sometimes it works out beautifully. Yeah. Sometimes it completely fails. It's and like that's a, the nature of combat. You know, a speech that falls flat. Right, right. Which the old like Theon in Game of Thrones speech, <laughs> where they listen, they smile, and then they knock him out. That's a great example, right? Yeah. That's the lead from top of the deck. Now, sometimes again, it works very well, and sometimes it doesn't. So, if you want to control the outcome, you go from hand. And if you just want to take a shot at it, you can go from the top of deck. And so that's a really cool choice that you get to make whenever you're deciding how to lead and your troops. You mentioned it, but I'll, I'll reiterate it so that it's clear. Um, you know, if you had multiple heroes over here um, trying to contribute to this control point, uh, and they both had lead cards under, only one of those would count. And you would get to choose. You would get to see them even if you put two randoms from top of your deck. You right. don't get to look at that until the end of the round. So when it's random, you don't get to know. That's the crazy thing. Yeah. yeah so, like, you, you know, know, if you sent Eckerd over here. You don't know how effective that speech is That's right. Be, right. <laughs> if you sent Eckerd over here first and you put a lead card down, you couldn't look down there and see that it was a three and then decide whether or not to send more heroes. You would have to know that it's a random chance. Move all Exitask over here, and he does a random chance. Maybe and then, he does a random one, yeah, too. Yeah. They both try to give their speeches, and then maybe one of them works. Yeah, at the end of the round, <laughs> then you get a look and pick one. Uh, but again, only one of those is ever going to account for each lane, including the dome. Yeah, all, all of the kind of control sections. That's that's 100% correct. So that's how you lead. So you can lead your troops. That's one of the actions you can do, too. You can move, and then you can lead your troops. Now let's get to the third uh, action, which is attacking, right? I mean, what would this game be without attacking? Would Zach even be playing it without attacking? I mean, nope. eh, it's hard to say. Unlikely. So every hero can attack enemies, and that an enemy is a minion or a hero. So I can attack Zach's army directly, or I can attack Zach's heroes. Now, I've got a chemo up here, and Akima is an example of somebody who's very good at attacking. Mm. So that's why we actually brought him up. Let's get a chemo in the dance. Um, some heroes can only attack things next to them, and these are melee heroes. And you'll see a chemo in the bottom left uh, corner. You see that little sword? That means that that is a melee hero, right? Uh, it's also pretty obvious if you just look at the hero. It's like, this This is definitely somebody who wants to be close to you. Yeah, right? he's got a giant sword. <laughs> to hug you. Yeah, he, to, to you know, just tap you on the shoulder and say hello. So Akimo is a melee hero, and that means that Akimo can attack anything next to him. Right, so adjacent to. So like, you know, if you want to attack one of my minions here, you got to get next to him. If you want to attack my hero here, you got to be next to me. There are other heroes that have ranged attacks. So let's look at uh, like Tlakali is a good example of this from the Talat faction. So Tlakali, on the other hand, is a ranged hero. So if you look at the bottom left, you'll see a little bow and arrow, and that signals that that hero is ranged. Now ranged works in very much the same way that movement works. You can attack anything three away. You can move three, you can attack something three away. Three is an important number. It's a very important number. Uh, so Takali is right here, and we got a little infighting going on. I just count hexes to see if I can count hexes not in excess of three. So one, two, three, I can hit Exitas. There's no, I don't need to worry about these enemy models. I don't need to worry about anything like that. Can I count hexes to Exitas? Over here, there's no way to get more than or less than three hexes between me and Exitas. I can't target Exitas with that attack, right? Very simple. Zach, you, you know the rules. But I, I feel like I'm teaching you at the same you are. time, which I'm is learning. really exciting. I'm, yeah. re I'm relearning just to make sure. We took a couple weeks off, so it's yeah. good. It's a good refresher. <laughs> now, there are, two, there are two exceptions to this. And we don't like to throw a lot of exceptions up front, uh, but it's just worth getting them on the table and understanding how they work. And a lot of games is very overborn. You talk about line of sight, and it's like, oh gosh, get out the manual. Well, or it's like a get the game where it's like true sight. You know, you have to like lean down and see if your model could actually see it. Which in Infinity can actually be pretty fun because it, I feel like I'm about to shoot somebody. It can play a thematic role. But. It definitely can, but it obviously it slows the game down, and it, it's a very different experience. And it's very subjective too. And hexes <laughs> kind of get you away from uh, that. So let's first talk about line of sight. So if you can draw a path to that target, to a target without crossing a white line. You By white line, you mean like the dome here. That's right. So the dome is in a special little zone. So in our example here, let's uh, let's just use old Tlakali because we were using uh, her earlier as an example. So Tlakali, while I can draw a line to Ixitas, only that two is spaces three away. hexes, only two spaces away. It's within three. Because there's a white line between me and my target, and I have to go through that when I'm counting hexes, I can't do it. Can't see it. Absolutely can't see it. Yeah. All right. So you can't see it through white lines. Can't see through white lines. Now, even that's even the case for somebody like Akimo, right? So while Akimo can be next to Ixitas here, 
because there's a white line between it, it's like, a, it's no. There's this energy barrier creating the dome. It's a can't wall. See it. It's a giant overgrowth, whatever it is, right? You yeah. can't see through there, so you can't attack. Now, the second thing is cover. And again, cover can be overborne, but it's very simple. So you see the line, uh, you see the eyeball with the line through it? It's on the screen right now. So that is the icon for cover. And that means that anything in that hex is considered in cover. So if Ixitosk is here, and this is there's two little hexes right here. It's kind of hard to see probably from your guys' angle. These two hexes have that symbol on them, the little cover symbol. So if I'm here, while Tlakali can definitely get within three, because I'm in cover, I simply can't be targeted. Now, there are some exceptions. I was going to say, there's exceptions to the exception. One is anyone who's next to that hex can attack into that hex. You, you can see it if you're adjacent You can't to take it. cover from a sword. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it's you can try. Pretty self-explanatory. So melee heroes can attack anything next to them regardless of if they're in cover or not. Now, the fascinating thing is heroes next to a cover hex can also spot for other friendly heroes. Sure. So like if Takala was here, Boom. Now Takali's within three of Ixitosk, and then Akimo, her friend, is next to Ixitosk saying, hey, shoot into Over these here. bushes. Over yeah. here, yeah. He's right here. So that's the that's the way that cover works. If you know, if there's just Takali here, can't attack him. Now Takali, even though I'm ranged, if I'm next to Ixitosk, I can still attack him. You can always right? see next to you. So it just, it just matters if it's more than one hex away. And then if I have a friendly model that is next to Ixitosk, then any ranged hero can see Ixitosk in that cover hex, right? So in this example, Takali, because she has a friendly hero next to a, an enemy hero in cover, can go ahead and target that hero. Again, pointing yeah, over that there. That can be very important. I see the yeah. beetle. He's in the woods. <laughs> now, uh, another important note on that is your allies are never in cover to you. So like if, if I've got a friendly hero that's in the see forest, I can see my Because they can spot themselves. Yeah, absolutely. They're like, I'm, I'm right or here. Or they're like, caca. <laughs> Heal me, please. <laughs> the code I'm symbol. Dying. So that's cover. So, so basically, this is, the, this is the flow of things. The line of sight and cover, very simple, not over complex, not overborn. And you get the hang of it super quick. Just look for that little cover hex and symbol. I can't tell you how nice it is that every hero is three speed. Mm -hmm. They can see three away. They can, if they're ranged, they can attack three away. I don't need to go. Now, what's her range over there? The, the number of times you don't have to ask that is actually incredible. It's and there's no measuring. There's no like, oh, you bumped a model. Are you within distance, right? Or like with cover, a lot of times in games, it's like, do I see through the cover to see you? And if so, are you touching it? And also, is over half of your base covered by the cover to get cover? Yeah. It's only partially <laughs> covered if it's ten percent. Uh, and all that subjectivity, it's very quick. It's like, Consult the chart. Right now, right? Takali so cannot see Ixitas, can't shoot. Oh, suddenly she can. Right now she can't. Yep. Right now she can. Yeah. That's simple. Easy. On, easy. On. It's like yeah. a light switch. So here's an easy rule of thumb. Uh, if it's within three hexes, if it doesn't go through a white line, and if it isn't benefiting from cover, you can target it. Now, it's worth saying target is a sacred word in this game. <laughs> Target needs to be written on the, the front of the box as like, <laughs> this is the one thing you need Target to Target tear. So for any ability, this is an attack. Uh, this is things that literally say target enemy or target hero. All the cards you would play are power cards, and if they say target. Target, target is just target, target. Look out for that. It should be in bold and underlined in red. <laughs> it's like, the keyword, and a lot of things target, right? Spells target, abilities target, etc. Attacks target. Attacks target. They must target. Um, Basically, target just means exactly what we demonstrated. Can you see them? So are they within three? Are you not crossing a white line? And are they not benefiting from cover? If so, you can target that model. And so that's what we're doing with this attack here with Takali, we're targeting. So um, that's a really important phrase. So anytime you see target in on a card or in the game or on a particular like uh, model, on a hero, just know that every time you see target, just think about that. Within three hexes, not crossing a white line, and not benefiting from cover. So remember, all, allies can always see allies, too. So you can always target allies, even if they're in the woods. So let's look at resolving an attack. Since we're here, we may as well give it a shot. That's right. So if you can target an enemy, you can proceed with an attack. So let's start with Takali here. So Takali, because I'm spotting with Akima, or you're spotting with Akima in this example, uh, Ixitas can be seen. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. So the first thing that you do whenever you make an attack is you look at your base attack value. <clears throat> so let's look at Takali again. Takali is, as you might expect, from looking at Takali's model and kind of art, 
is not exactly a powerhouse when it comes to attacks. Right? Sure. So she's got a little two number in the bottom left, and you'll see, so it tells you it's ranged with that bow and arrow. Then it tells you there's a two next to it, and that's your base value. So that's the value that you start at when you have an attack. Now, when you resolve that attack, you do what's called a flip. And when you flip, you look at what's called a modifier. And this is a cool thing about the game. Again, we're not rolling dice. There's not a lot of randomness to it. Whatever I'm flipping from the top of my deck, I have legitimately put in there. So it's my fault if it's not good, not, not, uh, not a random die's fault. So what a flip is, is let's pull up like uh, Charm. Is We've got Charm, and Charm's a good example of a card that has a really good flip modifier. It's got a plus two in the top right corner. So you see the top left corner you use for leading. That's your mana cost that you use for lead. So this card would add plus one if you were leading your troops. If you flip it for an attack or an ability that flips cards, it would add plus two. So if Takali flips this card, that's a four damage attack. So let's say we've got sense. a four damage attack coming in at Ixatosk. That means that now I want to go in and I want to look at Ixatosk's armor value. So if we pull up Ixa, we're going to have a two armor on Ixatosk. And you see it on the bottom right corner. So if you imagine that, that stat line at the bottom, you have the attack, you have the health in the middle, which we'll get to in just a second, and then you have the defense on the far right. Shield means defense. Yeah. I know you're I know you're surprised that that's how that the works. The sword means attack. <laughs> so two defense, and as you might expect, that's two armor. So two armor, four attack, because you had two base plus two from the flip, means Ixitas takes two damage. And when I take damage, you'll see I've got these uh, tracks here. The board comes with these health tracks that I have my little indicators of which model is which. So if Ixitas takes two damage, I simply move that track down two, and I have now healed. Easy or as I'm that. Now, I'm not healed. I have now taken, taken damage, damage. which is the opposite yeah. of healing. That's right. So that's Ixitas. Let's look at a different uh, attack that you might come across, and that's a chemo. So we'll bring a chemo back up. And you'll notice a really significant difference in the way that a chemo works, which is that I have a four base attack value, which is way better, but then I have those two symbols that flip cards. So yeah. I've got the two flip symbols. So what that means is rather than just normally I take my deck, normally I flip one and I take that modifier, which for here is a plus one on the board. For a chemo, I actually flip two cards and then I get to choose one of those cards to use as my modifier. So you see here, I, because I'm a chemo, a normal hero would have gotten a plus one on that attack, but a chemo can flip two and choose the plus three now that randomly flipped from the top. So that's now a seven damage attack coming in from a chemo. So he's got a higher stat and he's li higher likelihood of pulling a big number because he has that plus two. But of course, he does have the downside of being melee. So he would have to be next to a hero, which is obviously can be more restrictive uh, because your opponent can put things in the way or be far yeah. enough away that you can't quite get there. And that's basically how that balance works, right? The melee heroes are usually really good at attacking, and then the ranged heroes are a lot weaker at attacking. So it's a good balance, and it makes a lot of sense how that works. We also we want to look at uh, what happens whenever all of your health goes away, right? So let's imagine what happens. It's like, <laughs> it'd be a real bummer if your hero got knocked off the board and that was the end of it, which happens in a lot of games. That's how a lot of miniatures games work. But that's not how Dota works. That's not how MOBAs work. So of course, what's going to happen is when your hero goes from whatever health they have to zero, uh, then they're going to be removed from the board and placed on a turn tracker. And it's up here. And I'll actually, let's actually move this a little bit to show the turn tracker. All right, there you guys can see it. So it's up here. One, two, three, four, and five is the turns. And if Ixitosk, let's say turn two is the turn that we're on, and we usually have like a counter, you can put a counter up there. So let's say we're on turn two. So Ixitosk gets eliminated. Most often, you just come in on the next turn. So the moment that this turn tracker goes to turn three, at the start of that turn, Ixitosk spawns at the Nexus and can attack and, and join the fight. Now, the only exception to that is that the game checks for whether Ixitosk has gone that turn or has not gone. Yeah. So if Ixitosk hasn't gone, which means that he's not exhausted, then he'll come right in at the next turn. And that means you basically lose one activation with Ixitosk. Because you got knocked off the board that turn, which means you're missing out on using that hero that turn. Yep. And the game basically wants you to miss a turn. It wants you to miss one turn with the yeah. hero that gets knocked off. Now, if Ixitosk had already gone, then it actually comes in on the next turn, turn four. So no matter how you slice it, 
when a hero gets knocked out, they are going to be down one activation for that game. Yeah, and it's important to know a turn is after you've activated all of your heroes. So you'll go back and forth activating heroes and taking the three actions each until basically every hero that you're using has been exhausted. Um, and that happens for both of us. And then after that happens, we refresh, we move the turn round up, and then if there's any heroes that are supposed to come back on that turn, they, they respawn on the board next to the Nexus. 100%. You're right. So just to recap, on the attacking, I think that's everything that we need to know. Um, all attacks for range are within three. Most everything in the game, I think everything in the game, at range is, is basically three hexes. Uh, we have melee heroes and we have ranged heroes. If you shoot a ranged attack, you can't shoot something in cover unless you have a friendly model next to it, including yourself. So you can also attack into cover if you're next to that enemy hero in cover. Uh, and you can't attack across a white line. Doesn't matter if you're melee or ranged. Ixatosk is totally safe from these two heroes right here. Now Akimo obviously could just move right in here and ah! But uh, right now, Ixatosk totally safe. Now I don't, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but it, can you do any of these actions more than once in a turn? You cannot. So it's one, you get one move, one attack. That's right. And whatever other, and one lead, and whatever other action. Unless we cover. a card or a hero ability tells you otherwise, the framework of the game, you can only do each action once during an activation, right? Good to know. So a lot of the times it's going to be move attack. A lot of times it's going to be like move attack and then maybe lead to yeah. try to help a lane out. And then sometimes it'll be this fourth action, which is called skirmish. So everyone can do what's the super. It's like a, just a cool move called a skirmish, right? And it represents basically to me them kind of dancing in and out of combat. And you can like you can't really counter it, you can't really target them. It's just kind of like, hey, we're in the fray and we're not doing anything super like meaningful, but we're just like, oh, I saw you over there and I slapped you on the way out or whatever it is. <laughs> um, so a skirmish is basically a set of three mini kind of uh, mini options and you can do all three of them and you can do them in any order that you want. And you can do one or two of them. And you can pass on, or you can do one and pass on the other two. And those three options are moving one, moving one, and doing zero plus damage to something that you can target. And so these are separate instances of moving, as an example. So you know, if, if a chemo here was skirmishing, he couldn't move two right. past the minions. He would have to literally go one, stop, one, yep. stop. They're all separate instances that resolve separately, right? So as you said, I think that's the most important thing to remember <clears throat> is that if you do have a chemo here, I can't move through these minions with a skirmish. So move one, resolve, it has failed. He stood there. Can't do it. He did stand there. It wasn't supposed to happen. It's <laughs> well, supposed I, to fall We're supposed to edit that out in yeah. post-production. Um, but what you can do is like, you know, move one, move one, zero plus attack on Sakali. And so you say zero plus attack. That's just flipping the top card of your deck. Anytime you hear plus in the game, it just means plus the, the flip from the top of your deck. So you'll notice that you don't use your attack value. That's not relevant here. Every hero is the same. Zero plus the top on card. On a skirmish, it's zero plus. Mm -hmm. And for context, the average modifier on a card, right? It ranges from my, currently from minus one to plus three. Mm -hmm. So if you flip minus one, it's nothing. Nothing, nothing happens. happens. We always right? joke you don't about heal. that healing, yeah, you don't healing the heal, opponent one. Uh, zero is of course zero. And like if you flip a one or a two, and like Ixatosk, if he has two armor and you flip a two, his armor just soaks that right up. Now. One of, the, one of the things that caught me early was like, well, when I'm skirmishing, do I have to follow the rules of attacking sometimes? Or like, how much of it do I? And the, the key thing is, when you're looking at targeting things, that's when it really matters. So, you know, if Ixitask is here, I can skirmish with Takali, one, two, three hexes, zero plus, and then let's say move one into cover, right? right. Or I can, uh, let's say, move one here, attack, move one back. I can move to attack, or I can you know move to and not attack. Or like this is a really good example of you move one out of the dome, yep. shoot, move back into the dome if you want. And now just like normal, you'll notice if Ixitosk here as the target is in cover, you can't and hit with the skirmish. It's important to know when a model is skirmishing, they're basically using their attack range. Yes. So Akimo, when he skirmishes, he has to be next to you. Must be a melee uh, skirmish. Clicali, though, because she has a ranged attack, means she can skirmish from downtown. 100%. So that's what you meant. You have to still target. So like Akimo, you know, if he was here, he could skirmish out, hit Ixitosk with a skirmish attack, and then go back in. Uh, likewise, if Takali comes out, 
and has a chemo next to it, she can still see it now because there's she a can friendly still there. See it, yeah. uh, but if he wasn't there, you couldn't see him because he's in cover. Now here's where we get to really explore what we mean when we say the target keyword is sacred. Because you'll notice with skirmishes, you don't actually target the hero. Now you follow all the rules for targeting, line of sight, not in cover, but it doesn't use that keyword of target, and that's very much on purpose. Because a skirmish is designed to be kind of a, an uncounterable source of damage because you're in the fight, you're in the fray, right? Nobody's thinking about how they're going to dodge out of the way and those kinds of things. Sure. Um, so if anything in your hand or on your hero says you can't be targeted or uh, you know cancel this uh, thing that's targeting you, a skirmish does not apply. So it's not technically targeting your hero, which means that it's more universally uncounterable and usable in the game. Um, and every hero skirmish is the same. You don't reference the attack value. Move, move, plus zero attack. Stuff. Now, why would you skirmish? So usually, uh, uh, one of the uses for skirmish is just to get that extra two move. Because you like, only move once. Sometimes if I mix, I'm like, well, I got one, two, three, but I want to get over to this lane, so I might go one, two on that skirmish. And if something's here that I can uh, attack, a hero I can attack with my last skirmish thing, then I'll do it. But most of the time, sometimes I just want the, I just sure. want the movement. Or, you know, like if you flip it, if you start with a skirmish, because you're already next to a chemo here. Absolutely. You do the free attack, you move your two, then you do your standard move, and then now you're on the other side of the board. Yep, and now I have a third action where I can yeah. lead and kind of control that lane a little bit. Uh, so that's really important. The other thing, too, is you can't skirmish uh, against a minion. Minions are, you know, they're, they're, you're so zoomed out of that that mess. You would never skirmish with a minion. No, right? nobody would skirmish, with, skirmish a with a minion. That, when was the last time you looked at, you know, you watched Lord of the Rings and it's like, oh, here's like, you know, Gimli <laughs> skirmishing for a while with, with one some minion. It's like, no, he's like yeah. clobbering them all out because they're it, nothing. It's important to note, you can attack a minion. So your standard attack, you can actually spend your attack on a minion. Each minion only has one health. That's right. They nice. pretty well always die in the state of the game currently unless you have some kind of debuff to your attack. Everybody's two or higher, yeah. so like, it's not possible. Um, so that's it. So skirmish, we talk about it loosely, like, yeah, you can attack after you skirmish, or with your third skirmish, like, point. It's not an attack. Uh, you can target, you kind of target a thing, but it's not technically a target. So skirmish is kind of in this sweet little pocket of, like, it's just a different, you got to think about it differently. It's designed that way, not because it's written poorly, but because it's, it's really meant to be a counter to things that are countering attacks and movements and those kinds of things. So it's a different kind of ability. So skirmish, three options. Choose to do all three of them in any order that you want, or one of them, or two of them, or three of them, and resolve them one at a time is how that works. So that's skirmish. And uh, then we get to get into the final action, which is really where the game opens up into a brand new idea. So if we look at kind of recapping before we dive into the worship action. I was going to say, what have we covered so far? And so let's, let's recap here. Let's just put everything back at the nexus here. So if I'm looking at uh, somebody like Ixotas, for instance, my, my beetle friend here. So I could do for my three actions, uh, move, one, two, three. And then I could do a skirmish, one, two. There's nothing that I can deal damage to because there's no heroes next to me. I'm a melee hero. So nothing there. And then I could lead either by taking a card from my hand and putting it face down under Ixitos, like so. Or, if I wanted to be risky, I could take a card randomly from the top of my deck, can't look at it until the very end of the minions phase when I can't change the outcome, and lead that way. So when I lead, I have two options. And that's the majority of what I'm going to be doing is like leading, moving, attacking. Yeah, and one of the, before you move that, one of the things that is recommended you do is when you lead from your hand to have the card basically tilted like this, mm -hmm. and when you lead from your deck to have it like this, so that you and your opponent can remember easily. He's was, taking a chance. Was this a card randomly put there, or was this he a card they doing. intentionally put there? <laughs> Uh, so it's move, skirmish, lead, and attack. Let's uh, let, have, have Akimo come up here and do a little skirmish attack so, on... Uh, actually, let's do it on, on uh, Ekrit. She's, yeah. she's got lower armor. It'll feel better. Assuming that's what you did, right? Um, if it, so then you go and you would exhaust your card. So you would turn it sideways. Um, i go ahead and hit you up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you exhaust it just to show that it's, it's, she's gone. And then if Akimo went right, so very quickly you can see she's within three of him. So maybe he goes one, two, three... Uh, then he could attack. He's got that, that four attack, so then I could flip the top two cards in my deck. 
Um, you know, and I would obviously choose it between a zero and a three, the three, so a seven would be coming at accurate. And so it's the four is the base down in the bottom yeah. left, and then plus three, I get to I get to flip two cards and choose the one that I want to resolve, that little modifier on the top right. Totally. So it's his total is seven. If you look at Eckert's card, she's got a one armor stat on the bottom right. And so she would end up taking six damage. And then Eckert's on the track here, so I just go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then maybe I decide, I have one action left, that uh, I'm not going to be able to really control this land, so I skirmish. Right. So I just flip the top card for a zero plus. I'll give you a Eckert. random one here. It's a plus one, so you do one damage. Yep. I have one armor, so it does nothing. Nothing. But then I can obviously bounce into the uh, dome, or I could even bounce back into this cover hex in case... Steven has other ranged characters that come up, and I want to protect myself. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's the the long and short of it. And you could I would, also, of course, exhaust Kimo. Because we haven't shown it, you could also do uh, like a skirmish, uh, one, two. Nothing next to me, so I can't do any damage. A move, one, two, three. And then these two green minions are adjacent, and you're a melee hero, so you can attack adjacent things. So if you resolve an attack against a minion, remember a minion has zero armor and one health. Akima has a four attack stat, so I'll Seems flip, good. flip two cards. I get two plus ones. I can choose one of them to resolve, so I'll take a four plus one, which is a five. Five is going to easily kill a one health minion, uh, so that minion goes away, and they will respawn on the next minion's phase. Yeah, so you have move, attack, skirmish, and lead. Uh, and then the, the fifth action, which is the most fascinating. It's the secret. It's the, the secret, secret to the entire game, right? Yeah, it totally is. So let's talk a little bit, Zach. You, you've been diving into the lore book just a little bit, um, or maybe a lot. Top quiz. I, I, read, it, I read the lore book. <laughs> I think it's been a lot. So I sure did. Tell me a little bit. I know you like Karuma as a faction. Tell me a little bit about um, you know, what you envision whenever you see a Karumo. What are they worshipping? You know, what's the idea? So here? part of the lore is the game's called Sky Tear, right? Yeah. And so if you actually look at this map, we're we're on this like floating island uh, that's called uh, it's just a floating island, right? And Olanta, right? Is that right? Yeah. Or is that the uh, whole no, world? that's that's the I think that's the whole world. That's the whole world. Um, but the essentially there are these things called Sky Tear. Uh, which are pieces, fragments of energy that are these various uh, groups, cultures from a, across the globe are uh, learning how to manipulate and use for various reasons, right? Nice. Yeah. So, like, as an example, um, the green faction, um, Talat, Talat yeah. they have these little green minions um, that Stevens painted, actually. And they basically use this energy. These, these are actually, it's really cool. These are the bones of all their ancestors. Wow. And so they basically, like, fill them with energy from like the the bones of their ancestors to rise up into these little minions that are like that's wow. how they're controlling okay. anything right uh, where where and each each of these factions basically manipulates this energy in a different way partly because they they all serve different uh, gods in the universe right so Nupton, which is the the wind and air faction right it's like they have in a the certain desert, yeah. certain vibe and uh, Karuma, which is the faction, the red faction, the fire lava faction that I like so much, um, like he actually, the as a god, came down and embodied a, a person. He was the only one to do it, because uh, all the other gods think it's beneath them to like be a human, right? <laughs> but to yeah. them, the humans they've created and shaped um, are sort of their minions, so to speak, right? So it's a one one layer past that. Very nice. Uh, and I think that's ultimately who you're supposed to be playing, right? Is is these characters that are mani you know using these humans to accomplish what you're wanting to accomplish. A um, classic story, if you will. Yeah, so they, they kind of use this energy, and that's what the whole fight's over. Initially, in the, the first version of the game, there was like a, some early prototypes that I saw where each player actually brought half of the map. Um, oh. And they, they like smash together in this, because it's basically representing these two islands in the air that are smashing together, and now we're fighting it Very over, cool. you know, fighting each other. Um, so that, that's kind of some, some basics, but it's cool. If you're into lore, they, they have like a hardback cover lore book that you can actually read. And it goes into like half of the characters from each faction so far. Kind of gives their story and how they're related and the dynamics. And uh, the main setting uh, that's happening right now is the Great War has, has broken out. And As all, we might expect. All the factions are coming to the table to fight, essentially. So let's talk about the, the four worship. Basically, everybody can worship. And what that worship action does for you depends on the faction that you're a part of and the hero that you're, you're worshiping with. <clears throat> so let's start with Karuma. So Karuma's kind of like, they're basically marking their enemies with fire and with ash. Ash. That's yeah. what I. That's what I envision it, every time. Because it's it's not as one thing to note on that. It's not as simple as like fire, earth, wind, uh, and water, right? It's like 
technically it's water, but it's more ice. Right? Watery, icy, shape-shifting. It's really wintry ice creatures. Um, and then, you know, it's not just fire, it's lava, right? And it's embers and it's ash. And so it's all of those components of, of fire. So when a Karuma model does a warship action, they do what's called marking the enemy model. So you've got to target an enemy model, and we already know how to do that, right? It's just like anything else you would do. Um, it is at range three, right, always with Karuma. So it doesn't matter if you're a melee hero or a ranged hero. Sure. Anything within range three that you can target, you can mark. Anytime right? you need to target something for anything that's not an attack, it's range three. That's right. So. Marking, Karuma marking Ekrit here is a pretty simple idea, right? So you declare a warship action, then you apply a mark to whatever it is that you were targeting, and then something happens based on the hero that you're using. So let's actually get Miyuki into the fight here. Miyuki right. was one of my absolute favorites. She's another part of the Karuma faction, has some great lore attached uh, as well. I love Miyuki. So if you look at Miyuki, so let's start with the bottom ability. What does that bottom ability say on Miyuki's So card? the bottom ability is called Spirits of Sorrow. And it says, apply slow to the marked hero. Okay. So you'll notice next to marked, it has that same symbol you see on this red token. And that's the, that's the Karumo faction logo. Um, but And it's got that warship icon next to it. That's that like uh, swirl, the swirl right? right? The nice swirl. So that means there's usually, and for Karuma, this, this holds. So there's an active thing that happens the moment you mark something. And there's usually a passive thing that is based on who's marked or how many things are marked or whatnot. So when you immediately mark with Miyuki, you apply slow to an enemy. Now, what is slow, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you. It's not a rabbit. It's a snail. Uh, slow is easy. It's a condition, and it simply says minus two movement points. So if I'm slow as Ekrit, whenever I move, I have to move one instead of three. That's a bummer. That's a bummer. That's you a can't bummer. go very far. It's so not very good at all. slow and you're marked. Uh, and so the important thing in the marked, if you look up, uh, at the, her top ability on Miyuki, it says Soul Keeper. Soul Keeper, yeah. Yeah, and it says marked enemies within three hexes have minus one attack and do not flip cards during their attack actions. Can you believe that? So minus one and they don't flip anything to modify. And you'll notice it says marked enemies within three hexes and it doesn't use the keyword target. Right. Which is important because normally, like if uh, Ekrit was here in the dome and she was marked and we have Miyuki here next to her, you're in the dome, I can't see you. That's right. right. But her ability doesn't care. That's right. I don't it's have God to, stuff. It's divine right. stuff. Right? I don't have to target you for Soul Keeper to be working. So if you're anywhere within three of Miyuki while you're marked, then you get minus one attack and don't flip cards. It's like this debilitating aura, which is so fitting for the genre because that yeah. does happen a lot with heroes. And each Karuma model, right, has the ability to worship and mark an enemy within three hexes or that they can target. They, to... to Worship and mark someone, you have to target it. So right. it is a target ability. Yeah, right? so it's pretty cool because you see faction synergies where if uh, Akimo here is within three of Ekrit and she wasn't marked, he could mark her with a worship action and suddenly both of their marked passive abilities would apply to her. Right, yeah, so you got to use that teamwork, that tactics we're talking about. The teamwork yeah. is really important in the game. So that's Miyuki's thing. So what that would look like is Ekrit, if we look at Ekrit when she's marked within three of Miyuki, just thinking through this, right? This is a two attack. It now goes down to a one attack that I don't get that plus flip. So if I attack something, it does one damage. Now that's fine if I'm attacking a minion, because I can do one damage to a minion. But anything that has one armor, I would do no damage to forever. Yeah. Anything that has uh, zero armor, I'm only doing one damage to, so it's devastating. And, and technically, even if you're attacking a minion, if you flip a minus one, that's true. That actually I would means fail. that you miss yeah, the minion. I would which miss is crazy. the minion. You can't miss minions in this game. That's too devastating. Now, you might be asking, okay, well, I see conditions on the board, slow, mark, et cetera. Well, how do I get rid of these, right? Is there a recover action or something? So the way that you get rid of conditions in the framework of the game is you exhaust that hero. So you don't have to, you don't have to declare that you're getting rid of them. You take your full turn. You take all of your actions. And when your turn is over and you exhaust your hero, you always clear all conditions that are attached to that hero. So once Eckerd actually takes a turn, all these nasty conditions get removed and I'm refreshed for the next turn. Now, if I've exhausted and then you mark me, I'm going to come into that next turn. I'm going to ready. You still have gonna, those conditions. I'm slowed and marked because I didn't actually exhaust when I had those yeah. to get rid of them. Right. So very quickly, you'll start seeing, for a lot of reasons, the order in which you're activating these characters is hyper-relevant. 
it's extremely, extremely relevant. Now let's look at another Karuma. Let's, let's take a look at the pattern to kind of get a feel for how these models work on the red side of these, uh, of these warship abilities. So Hogasai is similarly built, right? You'll notice there's a direct thing that happens at the bottom with that icon next to it, and there's a bit of a passive up top. So Zach, hit me with the uh, bottom ability for Hogasai there. So when he marks something, he gets to use Purifying Fire. Hokusai may choose to lose one plus HP, so anytime you see that plus, that's going to be a card flip, to deal the same amount of piercing damage to the marked hero. So he marks someone, he flips a card, so let's say it flips... Uh, let's go here. Plus one. Uh, so it's two damage, he takes two, so I move this down, and he deals two piercing damage. Piercing. That's a new word we haven't seen. Well, it shouldn't be terribly surprising to anybody who's uh, been around the block or even just familiar with the word piercing. All that means is it doesn't apply armor. Okay, so it goes right through your armor. Right through your armor, yep. Uh, and then, of course, now that you are marked, Radiance says, marked hero enemies in Hogasai's line of sight, LOS. Mm -hmm. So line of sight, uh, you do have to be able to see them. Within three, not through a white line. Yep. Have minus one armor. So suddenly, if Ekrit was marked, she if she's within three of Miyuki and Hogasai and marked, she gets minus one attack, doesn't flip cards, and she has minus one armor. So they're they're very much pinning her down and making her way weaker. It's so good. Sometimes you do one worship action and it turns on a bunch of things from your other heroes that are around, and all of a sudden the board has changed and the <laughs> game has changed, right? Definitely. So there's Hogasai. So that's an example of kind of have the Karumo model of warships. So usually something happens immediately, and then there's a passive that is looking for how many things are marked, are they close to me, and if they are, they're also going to get essentially debuffed or otherwise affected by that mark. So that's Karumo. Let's move on to Nupton, shall we? Okay. Nupton's an interesting one. So the way that Nupton works is they create illusions on the board, and they basically confuse enemy heroes. That's the whole point. It's the thing about the wind dancing, the like the whirling dervish kind of thing, right? That kind of a vibe. So they've got the whole like uh, you know, wind, air, the in the setting, the desert. Live in a desert. Yeah. So I think of a mirage, mm -hmm. right? Where it's yeah. like you think you see something but you don't really see it. And the way that Nupton works is so they're going to get stronger the more illusions are around them. So even if it's not their illusion, but as other heroes' illusions are kind of in the fray and in the fight, that makes it easier for your heroes to be awesome because anyone around that is just like, what's going on? Like, th this doesn't make any sense to me at all. And Eckhart's like, I know what's going on. I know these are illusions. <laughs> Stupid Karumo. <laughs> uh, so let's look at how it looks to worship with a Nupton hero. So I've got Eckhart here, and I'm going to use a worship action. And when I do that, the easiest way to think about this is you take a worship token that corresponds to that hero's portrait, all of which are included in the base game and with any hero expansions. And it's taking the art basically on the standard image and it's black and white. That's right. So you can tell that it's something You did a little different. John Cena motion there too, which yeah. I really appreciated. Yeah. Uh, so when you worship, I like to just take the illusion and put it underneath the hero. And then you can move the illusion in the same way you would move your hero as soon as you summon it. So I can take this illusion and go one, two, three and put it three away. I can so when you worship, you generate your illusion and you can move it three. One, two, three, whatever, right? And I can just, I can put it wherever I want within three. It basically is how that works. I can just move it around because it's a little illusion, right? Um, now here's the cool thing about illusions though. So unlike marks, which is kind of a singular effect that happens and I can clear that condition, this illusion stays on the board essentially forever unless you target it with I was an attack say, is there a way, it. For, way for it to go away? The only way you can kill this illusion, at least in the rules as written right now, is to target it with an attack action to do damage to it. That's the only way. If it's caught in an AOE or something, it doesn't matter. If you happen to run across it in other ways, it doesn't matter. But if you target it with your attack action and do at least one damage, then yes, you will, you will remove it from the board. Now, if you don't do that, which a lot of times it's just a waste of time to do that, <laughs> Now, once I've already worshipped to get the illusion on the board, if Eckert worships again, I have two options. I can either reset it at my current location and move it three again, just like it was an original worship action, or I can leave it where it is and move it three from that point. So this is where the Nupton tactics get insane. And you get the choice, right? You is get the choice, yeah. You can either reset it and, and put it within three, or you can leave it where it is and resolve that move again. So like, I can move Eckert's Illusion all the way across the board 
by consistently taking warship actions so that eventually, maybe it's over here in another lane, and now I've got friendly heroes that are over here kind of getting the benefit of Eckert's illusion, and she's over here on the other side of the board. Now, how can you explain to me how that works? How the uh, projected thing uh, works? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a little more technical read out of other other heroes seeing it. Absolutely. So let's pull up. Um, I like Shafathi on this actually. Um, let's use Shafathi. Shafathi's kind of modeled in that beautiful Assassin's Creed kind of vein. So let's I do, do Shafathi's illusion, Here's your cat. which is quite nice. Um, so let's say Shafathi worships and just puts an illusion here next to, let's say, a minion, right? Okay. So the way that Nupton factions work, and you notice it's different from Karuma, on the card at the bottom ability, you'll see the little icon corresponding to that hero, and it's that's the illusion icon, right? So that's what their illusion looks like on the board. And any Nupton hero that can see that illusion is going to gain the ability on Shafathi's card. And it's, uh, you said any Nupton hero, but I assume it's only any friendly Nupton hero. Any friendly Nupton hero, okay. yes. You're, you are correct, yeah. So if your friendly Nupton heroes can see Shafathi's illusion here, then they reference Shafathi's card to see what benefit they get for doing that. And because what is that benefit? It's, it's called Schemer's Projection, or Schemer's Projection, I guess is the actual way to say that, an actual word. Um, uh, who's Schemer? <laughs> Uh, when I was like, oh, I thought that's how you spelled schemer. <laughs> <laughs> when a projected hero, and a projected hero means any hero that can see this illusion. What I mean by see this illusion is, is it within three? Can you draw a line of sight to it? You don't go through a white line. The whole thing, right? And it's the friendly, so you can still see it even if it's in coverage. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, 100%. So when a projected hero declares a skirmish action, you may predict one. Well, now we have a new concept, Zach. So... Let's say that Shafathi is a projected hero to his own illusion, which is a normal tactic. And so it's projected, a friendly hero can see any friendly illusion or their friendly illusion? It must be this illusion specifically. So this illusion matches this icon on the card, which means that you reference this ability no matter who sees it. So if, to just clarify that, if Akuti here can see Shafathi's illusion, she will gain the benefit of Schemer's projection. Okay, right? cool. So most of the time, you know, you're going to be benefiting from your own illusion, and then sometimes other heroes will come in and be able to see it. And it's basically in here causing havoc and chaos, and so it's giving you a passive benefit, even though you may not be the hero that created that illusion. Okay. So when a projected hero declares a skirmish action, so um, I'll do Shafathi here, I'll declare a skirmish action. I'm doing one. I can predict one. So predict... I can look at the top card. And you don't have to show the opponent. I don't have to show the opponent, no. I can look at the top card, basically, and then uh, if I want to, I can discard any number of them and then put the rest back in, in the order. So they don't I go on bottom, they go to the discard pile right. if you don't want them. 100%. So some things can get like a predict three. Yep. I can look at these three cards and say, uh, I don't want these two, and I'll put this one back on top. And do you get to rearrange them, or does it have to be the order? You do you rearrange them, them yeah. So, or I could, uh, let's say I discard this one and uh, put this one on top. Right. Yeah. So it's basically like, you know, and most, predict. most games have that. I think Opt is the uh, is the example in Flesh and Blood. Sure. Um, I think there may be some of that in, no, I don't think it's in Champions yet. But basically, look at some of the top cards in your deck, you know, put them how you want, discard the rest, and then you kind of know what am I going to flip for this skirmish damage. Or it's a good way to see like, oh, well, I'm going to lead from the top of my deck, but I predicted, so I know what that card is actually going to be. So that's an example of an ability that you get if you're a friendly Nupton model that can see this particular illusion. Then we have another kind of uh, kind of signature ability based on the warship action, and that is time overlap for Shivathi. So it says when you resolve a skirmish action, you can swap with your illusion. Wow. Yeah. So this is one of those cool ones where literally I could like, let's say I worship uh, and I just go one, two, three. And so now, if a cootie predict or if a cootie declares a skirmish, she'll predict one because of Shafathi's illusion ability. Yeah. Then let's say I worship again and I go one, two, three, and then I'm on Shafathi's turn. I do. I'm going to do a skirmish. Uh, and let's say Miyuki's here. I'm going to go one, one, zero plus a card damage to Miyuki, and then after that's resolved, Whoosh. I can literally. Flip to the other side of the board. How cool is that? Isn't that a great? That's super cool. Uh, Shafathi is just incredible. It's just super cool that you can do that. Um, so that's how Shafathi works. And most of these heroes are going to follow into this pattern. Like, let's look at Akuti, since Akuti is on the board. All right. 
Akuti is also going to follow this pattern. <clears throat> so Akuti's uh, illusion is somewhere here. Can you find uh, Akuti's? Yeah, I'm on it. I think I had it. I got it. So Akuti's got an illusion, and so she worships. She can put it on the board and then move it anywhere within three. So I'm right here, one, two, three. Let's say I just put it there. That was a hilarious three to the side and then there. Yeah, right? <laughs> Some clever, yeah. So there's three. Yep. So now she has similarly. So she has her illusion ability. It's called Resonant Light. It's at the bottom of the card there. It says projected heroes have plus one armor. So Shafathi can see this. Shafathi has plus one armor. Akuti can see this. Akuti has plus one armor. Nice. Astrida here is not in the Nupton faction. She's as confused about illusions as everybody else, so even if she's friendly, she does not get the benefit from this illusion. Nice. So these Nupton models are seeing this. They all get plus one armor, which is really incredible. And then Akuti has this special uh, ability revolving around her illusion called Retribution. Okay. So let's say I take another Warship action here on my next turn, and I go one, two, three. Now my illusion's here. Akuti's here, and let's say Miyuki's in the, in the dome here. <clears throat> Retribution says when Akuti resolves an attack action, she may deal one plus a flip damage to an enemy minion adjacent to her illusion. Nice. So she can declare an attack on Miyuki, and after that's declared, this illusion hits one of these minions and knocks it off the board. So you can imagine situations, right, where like Akuti's over here fighting in this lane, her illusion's over here taking minions off in the other lane, and it's a huge amount of control and kind of maneuverability that you can get out That's of that awesome. ability. And it, it really plays to their theme, right? Which is like they have these illusions going around, confusing and messing with the opponent. And the, the illusions can be lethal, apparently. Yes, they, they, they can they're, manifest. They're more yeah. than meets the eye. It's like that shadow self thing in uh, in D&D &D, uh, that always drove me insane. Shadow killer, I think it was. I can't remember. I died by it once. Um, then we go to Talot. So Talot is the green kind of earth-based faction. And their whole thing is uh, that they place pillars. And the Talot, you probably know more about them than I do, but essentially I think of it as like this universal earth network that they tap into with these pillars so that no matter where the who's seeing the pillars or who's around the pillars they can kind of all kind of talk to each other through the like comm station that is you know the connected <laughs> to the earth yeah. yeah so the way that talent works so let's use exitosk here since we're on this side of the board it's very similar to illusions except you basically just target a hex and again target right so within three not through a white line and in this case, you can target a cover hex. Just remember, a cover hex means that the models in that hex are in cover, but the hex itself is not considered in cover, if that makes sense. You can see the bushes, you just can't see into them. That's exactly right. That's a good way to think of it. So let's, um, I don't know, let's pull up, uh, I like, I like Akla. Let's get Akla on the table. All right. Akla's our, our blowgun. Uh, just one of the coolest assassins in the game. He can literally, his ultimate kills you. <laughs> yes, it's absolutely true. So the way this works is <clears throat> I can worship, and the first thing that I do is I, I say, what hex do I want to put this pillar in? So let's just make it easy. I want to put has the, to be within three. I want to put the pillar right here. I've got to target a hex, so yep. it's within three, and it's not through a white line. I can't put it here, but I can put it here or here. I can't put it here. I can put it here, etc. Right? All right. So I'm going to put a pillar. Right here, one, two, three. Now, before all of that technically happens, I choose where I want to put it. I have the option of destroying another pillar on the board to trigger Akla's ability. Now, before you do, before you place the pillar, you could destroy an already existing pillar. And it doesn't so, have to be his pillar, like the illusions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to this one and say, this is what I want to do. Then I get a chance to, let's say there's other pillars all over the board here. Let's say my, my Talit friends have been doing work. I can destroy one. Then I place the new pillar, and then I resolve the ability because I destroyed a pillar. So if you look at Aqua's card, on the uh, little bottom of it, the little warship icon, just like Karumo, if I chose to destroy a pillar, I can trigger this ability. And it says, deal one plus damage to an enemy here adjacent to the removed pillar. So the way that this works is, let's say that you're, we'll just use Miyuki as our, our test right. here. I'll put a placeholder pillar. Sure, here. we'll put some, some placeholders there. So let's say Akla wants to worship here. So I'm going to say, mm, I want to put a new pillar here. I want to build a wall of pillars because it makes me feel excited. 
So then I have the option to destroy any pillars that are currently on the board. I can destroy this one, this one, or this one. And can you destroy any number of pillars, or just one? Just one. So I'm going to destroy this one. And then I'm going to place my new pillar. And now I'm going to resolve this ability. It's called Nowhere to Run. Deal one plus to an enemy hero adjacent to the removed pillar. So Miyuki was adjacent to the removed pillar. So I do one plus a flip. So I end up doing two damage to Miyuki off of that ability. And of now course, she, she has the one armor. armor so yeah. the armor would work here, and she would take one damage. Boom. So that's it. Um, so that's the kind of the, the talent is probably the most advanced warship action in that you kind of you target where you want the new pillar to go, you destroy the pillar currently on the board, and then you place the new one. Now, alternatively, if you don't want to trigger that ability, you don't have to destroy that pillar, right? So you can leave this pillar here, decide to place this one here, and not destroy anything, and the ability won't trigger. So that's now, easy enough. Can I have 100 pillars on the board? You actually can. Yeah, there is no limit. So this is the, the, the living rules thing that are, that's being tested, right? So in the original rules, you could only have pillars equal to the number of talent heroes you brought to the game. So if I had two talent heroes, I could have two pillars out. What's currently being used in the tournament uh, format is you can have an unlimited number of pillars. Very cool. Which is way better. Can you imagine a whole just field of pillars? If you spent 20 actions just making pillars, I hope that you're losing the game. I mean, otherwise... Or you're about to win big. <laughs> yeah, otherwise Kyle looks about possible. to go wreck you. Um, and then you also have, on the top of Oculus card, you have this ability called Nowhere to Hide. And you'll see the little uh, pillar icon, little warship icon, next to Aqua's uh, ability there, Nowhere to Hide. That's very much the same as the projected hero ability of the Nupton. So what that's saying is, if you can see a pillar, this ability is now active. But it's only him, not his friends. It's only him, Unlike yeah. the illusions. So Nupton is saying anything that can see this gets this ability. The Talad are saying if this hero can see any pillar, it gets this ability. Yeah, it's kind of the, the So inverse. it's kind of the inverse, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be the pillar you place. It doesn't have to, you don't keep track of who places what. All Nupton or, or all Talad are kind of connected together through their pillars. So yeah. seeing one pillar is like seeing everything, right? It's like the all-seeing pillar universe. Um, and this ability says Aqua has line of sight on all heroes within three hexes and adjacent to a pillar. So you might think, well, I mean, most of the time I have line of sight to things three hexes. That's the whole point of targeting. But what this allows Aqua to do is these sweet moves. Because <laughs> I've, got a, I've got the most accurate blowgun in the West here. That's right. So as long as I can see a friendly pillar, and so right here you can see that Aqua can draw line of sight. One, two, three, I can see that. And one, two, three, I can see that pillar. But he can't see this pillar. But I can't see that pillar. Mm -hmm. So as long as I can see any pillar, this ability is active. And it says, I can draw a line of sight to heroes within three and adjacent to a pillar. So Miyuki here is within three, one, two, three, is adjacent to a pillar. Normally, I couldn't draw a line of sight. But what I envision happening is literally like shooting a dart through this and it coming out and hitting Miyuki, which is yeah. the coolest thing ever, right? Yeah, or uh, the, that's funny, because the way I pictured it was like, they're basically really connected to the energy of the Earth. And it's like, Someone, you know, I, I love the show Last or Airbender, Last Airbender. Love Last, Last, Avatar, Airbender. Last Airbender. Oh my gosh, best show uh, on television. And so I picture, you know, Toph basically making the earth come up, right, with each of these pillars. Mm -hmm. And so it's like they can sense the earth. And so yep. someone, need to see someone has raised up this earth and it's like, oh, I can see around that earth. And it's like, bam, I'm shooting into the void that is the dome. And it just hits the mark. Absolutely beautiful. Now, one of the things that is notable about. Uh, this ability, is if I don't have these pillars here, I can't draw a line of sight to this pillar. So this ability is not active. So nowhere to hide is not active. Remember, to have that little icon, that means I have to be able to see a pillar. Within three, line of sight rules apply. So if this pillar is down here, I'm not connected to the Talit information superhighway, right? That's right. But if this pillar is not here, I cannot see any pillars. And so I don't get to activate right. that ability. No longer connected to Talit there. Now, one of the great uses for this ability is these kinds of situations, yeah. right? So Miyuki is adjacent to this pillar. Doesn't matter line of sight for adjacency. She's adjacent to the pillar. I can see the pillar. I can now shoot Miyuki. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. Now let's look at how insane the Talit pillar Train Perhaps can the most get. insane. So let's just put, I don't know exactly, I assume this will work Speaking out well. Highways. I'll figure something out. So let's roll Ixitask into here. Belovingly, uh, or lovingly known as the Ixitaxi, 
to to friends and foes alike. I, I thought you were going to say I, I like calling him Beetlejuice. So I love there's some heroes in Dota I remember um, that had this like spike teleport ability and it also stunned and it was devastatingly good and I loved it so very much. Uh, there was that Nerubian beetle that was just like my jam. Uh, Anyway, waxing poetic about my my uh, my ha my history, my past. So Ixitosk has uh, an ability called Tunnel, and remember, any of these abilities on the bottom of the card for the talent, you have to destroy a pillar to use it. So let's say that I'm going to do that. So I'm going to take a Warship action with Ixitosk. So I can only target hexes that are not inside that white line because I don't want to, you know, I don't I don't want to yeah, do that. Don't want to cheat. So uh, let's say I go. Um, I'll put one here. Okay. Let's say I'll do that. So this is where this is kind of, and sometimes I'll flip them to say like this is the one that I'm going to place it's because not quite they have placed yet. They have There's a like white a white side back. versus a dark side. Here's where I'm going to put it, and then I can opt to destroy a pillar as I like. And so I'm going to do that here. I'm going to choose to destroy that one and remove okay. it. And then that means that I now place this pillar, and I resolve the ability, and it says Ixitosk and up to one friendly hero adjacent move six hexes and half to end their movement adjacent to the removed pillar. Now this is a movement, right? So I'm gonna have to follow the normal rules. I can't move through Miyuki on this, but it does mean that I can go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Both have ended adjacent to that removed pillar. It leaves the board. And now I have literally tunneled underground across the board That's using so the Talot. Not just information superhighway, but literally tunneling superhighway. And so that's um, that's just your warship action. That's it. And that's now my you first can action. Move with Ixitosk. Then I can so go. He, he can boogie. Move, move, move. Attack this minion. Yeah. Which is amazing to picture because he's just like a tunneling earth machine, right? That's like, right. He's, he's just tunneling, tunneling earth under machine, the ground right. wherever he wants to get. <laughs> so then Ixitox's second ability, the top one, if he can see a pillar you have unstable ground. So it's you're using, the, again, the talent kind of super mind to, to make your opponent's ground kind of quake as they're trying to move. And it says, when an enemy hero activates adjacent to Ixitosk, apply slow to them. And so adjacent doesn't care about line of sight. It does not care about line of sight. If you're next to it, you're next to it. That's correct. So Ixitosk here can see a pillar here and can see a pillar here. So as long as I can see one pillar, this ability is active. And so when Miyuki activates, it's immediately slowed. So you activate, and then like the first action is like, oh, well, I guess I'll move, but because I'm slowed, it's minus two movement points. I only get to move one. That's a bummer. That's a total bummer. So Ixitas is an example of what a lot of the tanks in Skyterra do. They kind of are just harassing, disabling pieces, because what tanks do best is if you don't deal with me, I'm really annoying. And if you do deal with me, it's really annoying. Yeah, because so he's got that nice two armor. He's got so a big two armor. to deal with. Yep. So this is a good example of where, like, you know, uh, for instance, we could do something like this. We could use the tunnel ability. Let's say, again, that we're going to place, uh, let's say we place a pillar here, and then we remove this pillar. We move one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say that one of our friends in the, in the early game had placed another pillar over there. So then I can, like, skirmish here, let's say. Mm -hmm. And now when Shafathi activates, Shafathi gets slowed. And these are both of my models, and they haven't gone yet. Both of them would It's like when it. I go with yep. Shafathi, he gets slowed. When I go with Akali, she gets slowed. So basically, if you're around Ixitosk and he can see a pillar, you're about to get slowed. That's Lots of slowed. That's basically how that works. Not so good. <laughs> All right, and then finally, we have the last faction, which is the Liliothan. They're kind of the blue, water, ice. Some uh, would consider the best. Some would consider the worst. It depends on who you ask. And that's the sign of a good game, right? Um, so the other thing, this is like, uh, they're shapeshifters. So they gain access to special abilities when they're shapeshifted, and then because it's a condition, they lose that shapeshift at the end of their activation. So they basically, thematically speaking, right, they turn into either partial or full versions of, like, animals, and that's, that's what they're manipulating the... Uh, sky tear to be capable of doing right, which you can't blame them for it. I mean, that's a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah, I mean, if you can become like an eagle or a mermaid or any number of creatures, a bear, that could be handy. It could be very handy. Yeah, Goldbjorn knows how handy it is. Um, so let's talk about Astrida. Uh, Astrida is one of the premier kind of pushing heroes in the game, uh, and you'll see exactly why. So let's say Astrida is over here in our favorite spot on the board. Uh, Astrida can take a warship action, and if we look at her card here. There's the bottom ability called Song of the Depths. 
and again, it has that icon next to it. That means if you are shapeshifted, this ability is active. So I take an action, I apply a shapeshift token, and I also like to apply it to the card itself, so I'm reminded that I have it. And it's important to clarify here, too, before you jump too far down. Uh, Karumo has the marked uh, condition. Yes. You have the um, shapeshifted condition. Right. So these are all conditions, same with slow um, and fast and disarm. Which we will get to. And yeah. frenzy, which is another condition. But conditions, all conditions, you said it earlier, but it's worth clarifying. When you exhaust at the end of your activation, the conditions go away. So exhaust. if you're marked and you were shape shifted and you were slowed and you were fast. I mean, there's a world where like, all this is happening, right? And it's just like, end once of her activation, my turn, it clear. all goes away, right? And it's pretty cool because red and blue are on opposite sides of the color pie, and then yellow and green are on opposite sides. And they both function interestingly similar, but different. So, like, Kurumo is marking enemies, which means Leothan is. They're marking themselves. They're marking basically. themselves. They're, They're like giving themselves a condition. Themselves. Yeah. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's it's and the, you see like you're saying the talent and Karuma are it's opposites. Like I'm projecting a hero, or I'm placing a pillar, right? But the pillar is group based, mm -hmm. and then the illusion is individual based. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you look at Song of the Depths, because I'm now shape shifted, now I don't get this immediate benefit. It just tells me that I now have a new ability. So I take an action, and it's one action point, right? I shapeshift. OK, done. Now I look at this, and it says, when a strata defeats an enemy minion with an attack action, she may lose two hit points to spawn a friendly minion. Well, hello. That seems all right. OK, so I'm shapeshifted. My, let's say my second action, I'm going to attack a minion. A strata is in the bottom left corner. You see that bow and arrow is a ranged hero. So I can attack a minion within three that's not in cover and not behind a white line. So I can attack either this one, one, two, or this one, one, two, three. Let's say I attack this one here. Two plus a flip of the deck, it's a plus one. Three damage to a zero armor, one health minion means that hero is gone. Now, because I'm shapeshifted, Song of the Depths is an optional ability I have. It says that I can lose two hit points to spawn a friendly minion. Well, why not? I'll take a couple of damage, and then I take a friendly minion and spawn it according to the normal spawn rules in the game. Now, how you spawn minions is that they have to be as close to the control point as possible. So right here, I've got a minion on the control point. That's as close as that minion can get. Then I look at every hex around that control point. I can't spawn onto a, a space that's already occupied, obviously. So I can spawn a minion here, or here, or here, or here because I'm spawning, and that's kind of a framework of the game. It tells me how I can spawn. I can't spawn a minion like this. Sure. I can't spawn a minion all the way over here. When I'm spawning minions, I have to have uh, be following the rules for those control points and getting as close to them as possible. Now, what about, what if there's an illusion here and a pillar here? Can you spawn there? They are not technically blocking elements. So there are special rules for spawning minions, and we'll probably get into that a little bit later, and we'll actually look at the actual cool. rule book for spawning. Um, these are the most probably confusing elements of the game is can I well, spawn I onto an illusion? Can I spawn onto a pillar? I still need to reference the rule book from time to time to do that. <laughs> so Great. we might actually need to do that uh, before we get out of here to clarify that. But spawning a minion is at its base as close to the control point as possible and not on any blocking element like a hero or a tower. Sure. Right? All right, so there's uh, Astrida. She can spawn a minion. She also has a passive ability that's based on shape-shifted heroes around. And so Song of Leothan, so she's a mermaid. She's singing her siren song. Mm -hmm. Friendly shapeshifted heroes within three hexes. So again, this is like Karuma. Within three doesn't mean you have to see them. It doesn't mean you have to target them. Uh, you apply disarm when damaging with attack actions. So if, for instance, yeah, Goldbjorn. Goldbjorn's in here. And Goldbjorn, let's see, he's also, he's in bear mode, right? Let's say Astrida is not. Astrida is not shapeshifted at all. She still says friendly shapeshifted heroes within three apply disarm. So this is one, two, three. Goldbjorn is within three. Goldbjorn is shapeshifted. And so now, because of Astrida's song, Goldbjorn is going to you be. You can hear it outside the dome in the distance. That's right, going to be disarming with these attack actions. So if Goldbjorn attacks Hogasai, after that attack is resolved, you will be disarmed. And what disarm means is that your attacks and skirmish damage are halved, rounded up. OK. So. Typically, as an example, Hogasai is a two attack. So is the half applied before or after? After the flip. the flip. So let's say you get like a big, let's say you get a plus three. OK, so then three plus two is five. 
half of that would be 2.5, and then you round up, you said? Yep. So it would be a 3 instead, and then you would actually still get to apply your armor. That's right. Uh, in this case, Hokusai is a 2 armor. So disable is really important, yeah. right? So disarm is really important because it allows you to take what are a lot of big plays, like your opponent has a bunch of buffs to their attack or a bunch of buffs to their skirmish damage, and it just halves it straight away. And sometimes it's the only way to counter some of these, like, I'm building a big attack pool kind of characters. Very cool. So we've got a strata. Let's find it, finish this off with Goldbjorn looking at, or with Korjoff looking at the pattern. So Korjoff is uh, one of my favorites. Over here, got a beautiful uh, feather bird cloak. And his, uh, his shapeshift ability is pretty interesting. So let's say we shapeshift Korjoff as our first action. And then we look at it and it says, Korjoff has plus one attack and becomes melee. When Korjoff activates, apply fast to him. So because I'm in my turn, I've already activated, so I don't get fast for that. But I do immediately get plus one attack and melee. So normally, you see in the bottom left corner of my card, I'm a three range hero. Whenever I shape shift, I become a four damage melee hero mm, nice. per my ability. So now I've got to be next to my opponent, but I get plus one attack. Now, relevant information here, why, how would this ever work? If you've got to, how could you ever activate when you're shape shifted? Well, let me tell you, you can shape shift your friends. Uh, it's a shape-shifting party. I, I can, I, uh, hey, you, turn into a raven already. Uh, so if Estrada on her activation comes in here, she can target a friendly hero within three, et sure. cetera, and she can shape-shift them instead of herself. Nice. So you can always shape-shift yourself or your friendly heroes that are also, also Leo. I'm picturing them pulling pranks on each right. other. Ha. Like, ha, you're now a mermaid <laughs> and you're on the land. Ha ha. So uh, if I apply this here before the activation of Korjov, then when Korjoff takes a turn, I immediately gain fast, which means I'm melee, I'm plus one attack, and I can move plus two spaces. Five is a much bigger number so than three. So now I'm rolling over here. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, also a weird way to move. One, two, three, four, five. And then I can take out these minions, or let's say I'm over here, and I can go one, two, three, four, five. And now sure. all of a sudden, Miyuki's in trouble. And Korjoff is particularly interesting because he represents a class in the game. It's the only class in the game that has a special rule attached to it. So you see in the top left of Korjoff's card, there's that fire symbol. Mm. That means that Korjoff is a mage. And as we all know, mages slash wizards are always special and too good. So what Korjoff says, because he's a mage, is armor just doesn't count. You can't you can't hide from magic, right? And it's important to note at this time, that's the only symbol that's right. there. That's the only class of character that has any sort of special. Ability. They may add that rule later on. They may flesh that out. But right now, mages are basically the answers to tanks. Tanks have a ton of armor, but mages come in and cast spells, and it's like, who cares about your plate mail? I've got a fireball coming at you, right? Yeah. So no matter how Korjoff attacks, no matter how the damage is done, if it if the source is from a mage character, armor is not going to apply. So that's what makes him at four damage particularly notable. If four, you flip a three, that's seven damage that goes right through armor. Yeah. So Kordoff is incredible in that way and then also has the Sentinel ability following in the footsteps of the template here. Friendly shape-shifted heroes within three hexes get plus one skirmish damage. So they all give other people that are shape-shifted something. Including themselves. Including themselves. Yeah. Uh, but inherently, they shape shift. Now, isn't is there uh, some rule where you can shape shift as your last action and keep it? Absolutely, yeah. So another problem that you run into with shape shifting is like, well, okay, I shape shift, I do a thing, and then I exhaust to end my turn, I get rid of it, and that's a lot of compression for actions, right? You got to do a lot to get that shape shift ability. So instead, what you can do, and this is the kind of the Leothan uh, special trick is that I take all of my, I take my two actions and then for my third action, let's say I want to worship. So what I can do is on my third action, I declare a worship and if I want to on my third action, I can immediately exhaust and place the worship after that exhaustion. So that way when Korjoff comes into like, let's say we do this with Korjoff, that's the most common use of it. When Korjoff readies, at the start of that turn, when you activate Korjoff, now you get fast and you get to be melee and go do Raven stuff, right? right? Now what you can also do, right, is like, let's say a stride is over here and wants to set up for next turn, I can take my third action to worship, 
stay shape-shifted, and then I can go into the next turn with three actions, not having to waste one on a shape shift. Totally. And or this is the only do... faction that can do anything like that, that kind of sneaks through the standard operation of events. Yeah. Now, conversely, you know, with Kurumo, if you mark someone after they've gone, they will be marked starting the next round. But right. again, anytime they activate, after they activate, that mark will go away. And then it'll go away. That's right. So those are all of the worship actions. I think at this point, you guys know everything that a hero can do during their activation. You can move, and it's moving three, and really the only thing you worry about is blocking elements. You can skirmish or attack. So skirmish is kind of a combination between move and attack, and then attack is your all out. You can attack minions, you can attack heroes. You can lead your army, so that's what the lead action is, and that takes a top card of your deck, or optionally, a card from your hand, and it counts the top icons in the top left corner and contributes to your lead value for how you calculate whether you did good army leading or bad army leading. Uh, and then you can worship. And worship is kind of what defines the factions and tells you what makes your hero special. I think it all revolves around sure. this worshiping action. And when you activate a hero again, you get to do any three of those that you'd like. Each of those can only be done once. That's right. Yeah, 100%. So all this activation, all this movement, all this fighting, what's it all for? Well, the goal is to win the game. That's right? right. And so what we want to do is we want to push to the nexus. So we're going to look at how we win a game in the traditional MOBA way, right? So let's talk about pushing the control the control token. So let's say we're here. Let's say we have that initial setup. Give me a, a minion here, if you okay. would, Zach. And let's say Miyuki's here. Korjoff is here. Estrada is here. Let's say Miyuki puts a card down uh, from hand. And let's say uh, Astrida, and I'll just clear this out. We'll zoom in on this example over here so you can see what it actually looks like. And one thing, I don't know that we've mentioned it, but uh, basically all minions and heroes that are within, again, three of a control point uh, contribute to that control point one. Yeah, we're going to take a look at that right now. Um, so we're going to look at how we resolve the minions phase. Let's say we've ended the hero's phase and now we're getting into, well, how did we do in this round of pushing the control token? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to presume that, let's say Korjoff and Astrida both led from the top of the deck. Okay. Let's say Miyuki led from uh, hand, so did a more calculated so effort there. to help the army. It's good. And now we look at anything that's within three of this control point. So one here, one here, one here, one here. Astrida's good, Korjoff's good and um, Yuki's good. Now, cover and all of that's not going to matter. The control point is a sacred object. It's the control point, right? You can't hide from it. It's telling you where your army is and, and how the game is progressing. So at its face, I have four control to your three control. Yep. You have three things. I have four things. Then any heroes that have led get to reveal cards from their lead action. So I've got a two here and a two here, and I have to choose one of these to resolve. And not let's, both of them. And let's say, just for the sake of example, I've got a three here. Yeah. Because that makes it a reasonable choice. So I obviously want to resolve the higher one. So this goes to the discard pile. I add this three from Eye of the Storm. So you see in the top left corner, there are three ruins, three mana icons. So I've got three from the lead card, two from my two heroes, and two from my two minions. So that's a seven total value on my lead, or on my control. And then you, Zach, have one, two, three for the things that can see the control point, plus three for your lead card, which is six. So I have seven, you have six. That's incredibly close. Very nice. <laughs> one so away. we calculate the difference, and then we remove the difference in minions from whoever lost. OK, so I lost by one. You lost by one. So I will take a minion and remove from One board. minion is gone. Then. We use that same number to determine how much the control token moves. So I'm going to move the control token one space towards your towers. Now I can either go there or I can go here. So it basically has to go to a space where it's getting closer to the tower. It must get one and closer to the tower. Being my tower. That's correct. OK, then what happens? Then we respawn two minions starting with the winner. And so the way that I like to do this is I will actually, once we calculate how many uh, minions have been lost, so you lose one, we both kind of take our minions and put them aside. Then we move the control token, and then we put these minions back. And then we take two minions, and we spawn them. Again, spawning minions, they have to be as close to the control point as possible. And you can share the hex with one enemy minion. So loser places, or sorry, winner places their minions first. 
believe that's right. Winner places their yep. minions. And even if you lose, you still get to place two minions. Always. So it's like it's a, it's an example. If you played Dota or the MOBA games before, your minions are constantly spawning and going to fight, right? Yeah. So even if you just got hammered a little bit, those minions are going to still come into the fray. So I won. So I'm going to place. Let's say I place a minion here and here. Now I can't place a minion here. That's two away, and it's also not in the lane. So that's an illegal placement. I can't place a minion here because there are spots that are closer to the control token that are open. Makes sense. So let's say I spawn them there, and then you get to set yours as well. And again, they can share lanes, but I also don't have to share lanes, right? You so do like not. I can place yep. minions here, and that's going to make that difficult to move through. Yeah, that is 100% right. So now the minions have been placed. So then we would go to number two. We would resolve the lead conflict over here. And then we would go to number three. We'd resolve the dome here. And then we'd go back to the heroes phase. So let's look at what happens if, uh, let's say, I'm pushing really well. Let's say, hmm. uh, let's say, actually, let's just leave it exactly where it is. Yeah, I think it was totally fine, right? Yeah, and then uh, even these. These, can, these are within three. Within that's three, within three. Yeah. So now, let's say one, that. One caveat yeah. I want to ask, because you said within, and within isn't targeting. But uh, if Hogusai was here, Does he's within count. three. But he doesn't count because he's inside the deck. Does not count. You must be able to see that control point. Okay, you have to be able to see it. Yep, that's right. That's the way I think of it in my head. Can I see that control point within three, not uh, behind a white line, and cover doesn't matter for this phase. So yeah. can I see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to count my control because I'm in range of my army. I'm like, hey, march harder, fight <laughs> better. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm at one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. You're at one, two, three, four. Let's say none of us led this turn. We just kind of sat around for no reason. Uh, then I'm going to now win this conflict by one, right? Or by two. By two. Because it's currently plus one hero and plus one minion. So now you remove two minions. I'm going to set everything aside. Yep. And then I move this control point two. And then I bring my minions back in. And I can't go where Miyuki is. I can't go where a tower is. So I have to go to the outer rim now. Let's say I put one there. And then we both spawn two more minions. And one. it's important to note, too, when I'm going to switch this just for clarity. One. If Miyuki was here instead, mm -hmm. uh, when the control point comes into contact with the tower, it stops. It stops. So it wouldn't yep. keep on going. It always uh, stops at the next like big object. Once it's at a tower, it stops. And so then uh, I'm going to flip it back just because sure. that's how you spawn. And you can throw a control point under a hero, too. That's that's totally legal. Yeah. And so then, it, the again, I, just because you could spawn out here doesn't mean I can. That's right. So I start with a control point, and then I have to go. I have two more minions, and I have to go in these spots. As close as possible, yeah. As and what you'll that control see point. here is earlier Steven talking about a natural catch-up mechanic in this game, which is the further the control point gets away from Steven's side, you can see now his heroes actually aren't within three of this control point. So for him to contribute to this, he's going to actually have to spend actions to get closer. Uh, and the closer he gets, uh, when our heroes go away, right, like if Hogusai gets defeated, when he gets to come back, he's going to get a spawn next to my nexus. And so when as the action gets closer and closer to your nexus, that's also where your heroes are going to be. And so it gets, I get more efficient the closer it comes to my side of the board. It's perfect. So like I'm pushing here, and now Hogusai respawns here, and it's like, oh, I'm going to go one, two, three, and I'm, I'm going to come rough you up. Party time. Yep. And you'll also notice the concept here that's really important is that if nothing changes, I win by one the first round, yep. it's a snowball. Yeah. So then I'm going to win by more, by more, by more, and then eventually your entire base is pushed down without any hero involvement whatsoever. Yeah. And so so much of the game is finding a way to either create these disproportionate numbers advantages on these control points or to prevent them from your opponent from happening. That's 100% it. So now what happens when you get to towers? So yep. if the control point is within three of a tower, again, our favorite rule, within three. So if this control point is within three of, of the towers, of the tower, yeah. yep. then they will count as like excess minion damage whenever you're destroying minions. So let's say that it's just insane. And I've led over here. You haven't led at all. Oh my gosh, this is this lane is falling apart. We go to resolve it. It's a three. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven because of this three lead card. Yep. And I only have four. You only have four. So you went so by seven. 10, 9, 8, 7. So now that's <laughs> seven damage to your minions and towers. So first yeah. we defeat minions. So I'm defeating three. Then I'm at you're still four damage to account for. That is now coming from towers. One, two, 
three, four. Yep. Now, the towers are still standing. There's still a little bit of life left in that tower unit. But the advantage that I do get is that anytime I destroy a tower during the minions phase, it, it could be six towers, it could be, well, not six, actually. That's it could have been all five be. or one. Whether it's two towers or three towers or four towers, if a tower is destroyed during this phase, I draw one card. If I destroy four towers, I do not draw four cards. If I destroy three towers, I do not draw three. I always only draw one card if at least one tower is knocked down. So I get a little benefit, ooh, a card. And then I go to the next round, right? Yeah. So then once eventually this last tower has fallen, a few special things happen. Now we're going to start trucking towards the nexus. So let's say I win by like three or four. We go one, two, three, four. And again, once it connects with the nexus here, it stops. Now it will stop. And then all of that excess damage is going to go to the nexus. Once all five of these towers are destroyed, now remember it, it minions first, but then the nexus is destroyed the game is over. Now, what happens when you don't have towers, It's though? really bad. So once a tower goes down, you no longer spawn minions on that side of the board. So even if this was here, after you destroyed this tower, and you have all these minions, right? They're starting to circle up around That's this right. thing. That's um, right. Once you take that down, the, the two that I get to put on the board actually don't happen anymore. I and get so to spawn two, and look at that. It becomes a problem, because this is three, six, seven, eight. Without any heroes or lead cards, you're at eight. That's right. Uh, with these two, you're at 10. If you play a card down, you're at 12 or 13. So I have to come in and remove some minions. If not, right, let's say you win by five. And this is worth saying, too, right? You win by five over here, and it moves one, two, three. Those extra two don't go anywhere. They don't go anywhere. Uh, it just stops. Because this, this control point, when you won, isn't within three of the target. That's right. So it doesn't do any damage, but it does get to move all the way. That's right. So usually you have one turn where nothing's going to happen to your nexus while that pushes to it. And then if I win by five on this side of the board, the game is over. Yep, and that win condition is always hanging out. It's always there. No matter what's going on, that win condition is always there. And that is exactly what happens in Dota, right? That once they destroy your little spawn factory, your minions no longer spawn. So the only way to fix that is to get heroes in the game to go ahead and, and fix the problem because the heroes are the only way that's gonna, that scales are going to balance at that point. So the pressure is there. So that's how the lanes resolve. Let's look at how the actual outsider resolves here. The third so, lane. Zach, let's give you some, let's give you some uh, bonus, uh, you know, some bonus uh, examples here. So let's say you've got two heroes in the dome. I've got one. Let's say I didn't lead, or let's say I led uh, for... I'm going to tell you I'm going to lead uh, for one. And then why don't you lead for one or two or three or however much you want to lead for. I'm Actually, by, by three would be a good example. I got a three. That's all I got. So we resolve the dome in the same way. So you got to be within three of the control point. On the two-player map, there's no way to not be within three of this control point as long as you're in the dome. You'll notice that on the, even the outskirts, I'm within two. If you're in the dome, you're contributing. If you're in the dome, it's the dome. It's the dome. Let's go. So then the same way we, we look at any lead cards, and we can resolve one from our uh, people that are in the dome. I have a three again. You have a three, I have a one. So I have one hero that can see the control point and one from the lead card. So I'm a two, and you're a three from your lead card, four, five for your heroes. Mm -hmm. So you're going to win by four, but on the dome, excess doesn't matter. You either win or you lose. You either win or you lose. Or you that's, tie. That's the way the Thunder Dome works. Uh, or you tie, which happens a lot. And if you win, you get to take the Outsider card. Now, there's five different Outsiders currently in the game, and probably more to come. And there's the Standard Outsider, which comes in the base game. And we'll use the Standard Outsider. So it has specific spawn instructions, where it says to spawn the Outsider, and then it can act like a model for this moment. You can move with it, you can attack with it, you can skirmish with it, you can't lead with it because it wastes time. This outsider particularly says it can't move. Yeah, it, this one does this, say it this, cannot this move. This big thing coming Normally out of the Normally you can, but this one yeah. uh, particularly you can't. And so the spawn instructions on this one, it has to have at least one of its uh, base pieces inside the dome, one out. It has to ride that line. So, you know, that looks like this, uh, or it could look like this, and it can go, you literally can put it anywhere. Yep. And, and you can use the outsider out. to do all sorts of stuff, right? So yep. they usually have special abilities like this one. You can draw cards with it. You can always attack enemy heroes with it. It's got a three attack at range. Yeah. And most of these, they, as the outsider, get, also get three actions. Yep. So you look at his card. You can do three of those things. 
uh, and then it'll tell you if anything special or wild happens, which is cool. That's right. And it can attack minions. You know, it can try to clean up this mess for you over here. It's like, yeah. I'm going to attack this minion. Maybe I'll use an ability. Some of them have abilities that defeat minions, And I do believe it's a blocking element, right? You can't walk yeah. through the outsider? 100%. Yeah. And so once an outsider is spawned, it stays on the board for the next turn, right? And it stays on the board until the dome is won again, and it respawns yeah. in a different way. But if no one ever wins the dome, it never, it never comes out. It never it yeah. stays so like, right here for the rest of the If we tie the first round, it, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If we tie the second round, nothing happens. But then if someone finally wins it, obviously it comes out and it stays until... And it'll stay there. Now, if I win it next time, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to spawn it where I want it. And then now we're going to resolve my activation with the outside. Yeah. And it'll stay there until somebody wins it. Uh, and there are different outsiders, and they have different spawn instructions. Um, so, for instance, like uh, Terror of the Endless Night is a good example of this. He spawns in a hex cover, right? The creepiest outsider that there is, yeah, spawns in like a cover hex. So I would put that outsider in any of these cover hexes. He's the boogeyman. And then has a bunch, yeah, it's like the uh, Bigfoot, basically. <laughs> and then has different abilities that affect the game differently. So the outsider you bring to the game is an important choice because depending on who's going first or second, Either your outsider is going to be in the game or Zach's outsider is going to be in the game. And so it's a deck building decision that you make, like, uh, do I want it to shore up my weaknesses or am I planning to lose the dome a lot so I just want it to not hurt me as much as it possibly <laughs> the least, could? Least, and least effective against That's me. right. Now, that is the standard way to win the game, right? You push your troops into the opponent base, you take out their nexus because you're a great Dota player. But there are other ways to win the game, and that's what the two-lane two map is all about. So the two-lane map always has three random objectives tied to it. There's a bunch of different ones. About 10 of them, uh, I think, are in the pool at any given time. One of them, actually, the new one in the, the newest uh, expansion as of this recording, actually makes the Outsider an attackable model. Normally, you can't attack or hurt the Outsider. But it actually makes it where you can, and whoever kills the Outsider wins the game. Which is totally different. And I think these alternate win conditions add a ton of replayability, because you, you can't just build a list around the singular win condition of defeating the Nexus. You can always defeat the Nexus and win, but you know there's going to be a mixture. And, and usually the two primary themes are there are aggressive attack-based objectives, like um, one of them is defeat three enemy heroes. Yeah, right? Onslaught, I think, is the name of that one. Um, and then there's there's control ones that, that basically, you know, you win the better you are at controlling either the dome or various lanes or various parts of the game. Yeah, like Right Breach is a really good example of this. Right Breach is a classic. Uh, you just got to knock down the right side towers and you win the game. Yeah, there's also a Left Breach. There is a Left which Breach. Which is the same thing. And sometimes they flip at the same time. And it's anybody's game. And now remember, even in the presence of these three other win conditions, if you destroy the opponent's nexus, you win. So that's always on. And then there are alternate win conditions designed for like tournament play, competitive play, et cetera, that are there to speed up the game and kind of give you those objectives that play to the fundamentals of Sky Terror in the mobile format. Just do so a little bit quicker. So if you knock down the right side of the towers, you win the game, you know, those kinds of things. So that's, that's how the alternate win conditions work. And there's a three-lane map that has no alternate win conditions, and it is classic Dota. Oh my gosh! Three mid lanes, lane, left lane, tons right of lane, heroes. two domes, so two outsiders in the game. The three lanes incredible. There's also a one-lane map now, where it's just one big thing in the middle with two domes on the outsides. So the different maps that are going to be released for this game, new heroes are going to be released for this game. It's absolutely exciting to think about, like two years from now, yeah. where is this ultimately going to go? Uh, and so this is the basics of Sky Terror. This is what you need to know about how you move things, how you attack, how you resolve minions, how you attack a Nexus, how you ultimately win the game. Everything here is the flow of the game, so you can really understand what's under the hood on this one. Now, the added benefit of Sky Terror is cards, power cards. It's a card game. And it's not, it's not hard. We, we can get through this very quickly, and uh, you'll understand exactly how it works. So let's look at a basic power card. I'm going to pull up uh, one that we've seen uh, a little bit earlier, which is called uh, Migraine. So Migraine is an example of a power card. Now you'll notice that in the top left, we've been using these top two symbols to contribute to our lead values. Now that is absolutely how the cards work, but this also tells you how much mana that spell costs for a hero to cast it. Now the coolest, one of the coolest things about the tidiness of this. I feel like I say that a lot. The I coolest know. thing of this I know, game. It's the just, coolest thing of this game. It's just so good. So one of the best things about this is that your mana, the mana of every hero on the board is equal to the turn of the game. 
Turn so one. if it's on turn one, one every hero's got one mana. If it's turn two, every hero's got two mana. If it's turn five, every hero has... Five mana. Five mana. Nailed it. That's correct. So, two mana to cast this. When you play a card, you immediately use that mana. Then you see in the top right, that's the modifier. That is not impactful for the spell whatsoever. That is only for when you're flipping it off the top of the deck, so you don't need to worry about that. Then in the middle, you have a little icon. And there are two examples of this. So the first example that you see is Migraine. We'll look at a second example real quick called Swiftness, just so you can see the difference. So Swiftness is a card that has one arrow in the middle. And I like to think of this as active spells. So for a hero to cast this spell, it has to be during their activation, and it has to be the thing that they're doing to kind of start a chain, if you will, or to start a stack. So it's the thing that you do, right? It's like it's not responding to anything. Yeah. It's not your opponent's turn. It's none of that. This is the most restrictive type of spell. It has to be your you activation. You have to be going with that hero. And you to have to be card. playing it first, right? But then we go back to Migraine. This is what I call kind of a universal spell. So Migraine can be used during your activation, during your opponent's activation. Uh, it can be used from a friendly hero during a different hero's activation. You can use this spell pretty much any time that you want to. As long as you have the mana to cast it, you can cast it. And then it has an effect. It's called Migraine. Apply Disarm, deal two damage to target enemy hero. That's it. Disarm that's condition. It. Disarm. And, and it says target. Damage. So remember, target's a keyword. That sacred, beautiful keyword of target. Yeah. Within three, not behind a white line, not in cover, you can target the hero, right? Now, one of the great things about this system is that things are going to resolve in a stack, right? So like a basic, and this is it literally, we can show this on, um, on the board here, and we're going to do that now. So Zach, grab a couple of reactive cards that, uh, that are going to matter for you, and I'll kind of show you guys how this is going to work. And I'm going to start with like an active uh, spell and then a reactive spell and all these kinds of things. I have a really good reactive spell here. Okay, let's so say let's... say I've got... Let's where's set this my up friend? Here. Shafafi. You're going to do something to Shafafi. Change the pack, and then let's do a uh, Nourish as well. Uh, how many mana do you need? Three? Two. All right, so let's say we're at three mana, so we can show this off. So I'm activating with Korjoff right now. Okay. Now, when you're casting spells, they don't take actions. This yep. is a, you know, you declare an action, spells can happen during that, then after that action, you know, things are happening, you can cast spells, you can pretty much cast them whenever it is that you want. And technically, like, so if you're activating Korjoff, you declare you're activating with him, mm -hmm. and there's a moment. There's a window. You can play at both the one arrow and the two arrows, because it's your turn. Yep. I can play two arrows here. So you, you're the active arrows, player, yeah. so you get the first chance. Mm -hmm. If you pass, then I get a chance to play something. That's right. Uh, and then you actually take your first, declare your first action, right? That's right. And so let's say that um, I activate Korjoff, and before my first action, there is that window. And so Korjoff is going to start off with a spell called Strength of the Pack. Now we're on turn three, let's say, so we have three mana. So I'm going to declare Strength of the Pack. And when I do that, I look and see, does it say target on it? And target it, is the sacred word. If it does, I need to declare the target of this spell the moment that I cast it. Consider it kind of like a cost of the spell. In traditional games, that's how it works. So it has the singular arrow, so only I can cast it on my active turn. So it is Korjoff's activation, which means I can cast it from Korjoff. If it's Korjoff's activation, I could not cast it from Astrida. So it has to be the active model, and it has to be the first thing that I'm doing on the stack. Once spells start getting slung, these icons mean that I cannot cast that in response to things. Yeah, so that's why there's the two arrows, too. It's like, you can technically play a two arrow in and of itself. I could play it right now, or I could play the one arrow right now. It's not my turn, so I can't play single arrows. That's right. And also, once we've started a chain, right, only reactions can be played. Only reactions, yeah. right? Think about this as kind of like a, this is the main spell that I'm casting, and then we both have opportunities mm -hmm. to react to that spell. So you play that, and I assume you're targeting my Shafafi here. I'm going to declare Shafafi as the target, and uh, I, my two mana is immediately used, and now there's a pass or play action. It starts with the active player. I'm not going to stack anything on top of that. You get the reaction if you'd like. And if I pass, it would just resolve. And That's if right. I don't pass, yeah. Yeah. obviously yeah. it's going to happen. So I will react, and I'm going to play a card called Time Warp. Mm, beautiful. Uh, so Time Warp costs two. You'll see it's got the uh, two arrows on it, so I can play it. And it's got a very simple ability. It says move the caster one hex. Right. So let's just go ahead and build this stack. Yep. 
So now this spell is stacked on top of my strength of the pack, and that's going to tell us the order we resolve down into. So let's say, well, okay, so I think that that spell is going to, I can't cancel it, I can't do anything about it. So I'm going to take this opportunity just to cast, uh, let's say, a Nourish. Okay. I'm going to use my last mana, I'm going to target myself, and then it's going to heal me three, and then it goes to you. Do you want to play anything? Uh, so I will pass. Okay, and then I'll pass as well. So then we start resolving from the top down. So first, I'm going to resolve Nourish. I'm going to put that in my discard. I'm not in my discard pile. That is something I do all of the time, <laughs> and that is absolutely wrong. Oh, so, when so you, good. when the spell resolves, you do its effect, and then you attach it to the hero to show that you've used that much mana this turn. Very tidy. So once you've exhausted that three mana, you know that I can't cast any more spells that turn, right? Yep. And then I heal my target three hit points. So let's say that Korjoff was here. I'm going to go one, two, three, and heal. And you can't heal past your total health. That's worth, right. Worth mentioning. Yep. Uh, it's also worth mentioning, now that that's resolved, actually another thing happens here. A window is open. Another window The pie opens. is in the window. So still. starting with the active player, you could choose to react again uh, so before this hand, next thing like, resolves. Well, I might, I might play another here, but no, I'm going to pass there. OK, so then I also pass. And then time warp would resolve, and it says I can move the caster one hex. So I take Shafafi, and I'm going to move him into the mm. dome so that Steven can no longer see me. And this resolves, and again, it attaches to my Shafafi, wherever he went off to. He's over there. I got you. Here's your Shafafi. So you can attach that. So now two mana is, uh, is officially spent, spent for him. you. And then again, we get another pass or play. And then it's like, oh, now you're out of range. So maybe, do I need to change my plan? No, I don't have any cards that would affect this, so I'm going to pass. I'll also pass. So now right. it actually resolves. So now strength of the pack resolves. Now when a spell, particularly one that targets, is resolving, you actually recheck all of the targeting conditions. So my target hero that I've targeted Shafafi here is actually no longer targetable. Because remember, now you're behind that white line, which means you're no longer able to be targeted. So I can't deal this damage to a target hero, which means this spell effectively fizzles, but I still cast it. So it now consumes my mana. I've spent three mana, but I didn't get the benefit of that spell because of your wily Nupton tricks jumping into the dome as I was trying to sick my minions on you. Yep. And so it's worth mentioning too, right? There's a opportunity for the active player to play actions and, and the my, me as the reactive player to play reactions before your first action point is mm -hmm. spent. And but then, mm -hmm. also when you declare an action, so you declare an attack, right? Same thing could have happened. Korjoff declares an attack against Shafathi. That window opens, opens a window. Yeah. So if, if the attack were a blank thing looking to resolve, right? Yeah. Because an attack reads, target a hero. Let's just put, this is the, the attack yeah. that's going to... That's the attack, right? You're targeting me. So you have to choose the, the target. Mm -hmm. And then now you get the first chance to react. So I, the window's open. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass. I, I want that attack to resolve. Yeah. So maybe into that stack, I also play Time Warp, right? So time warp happens. We get a pass or play. And it's like, oh, no. Well, um, <laughs> hold on. Um, maybe, uh, so I know Zach's going to move into the dome. What if, I, uh, what if I played a chasm in response? Because it has the double arrow. So if you look at chasm, it has that double arrow, which means that I can respond. You know? So now that we're in the response phase of this, I can respond with chasm. And I'm going to try it. I'm going to see, OK, well, maybe I'll do that. And then it goes back to you. Do you have any pass or play? I have that? nothing to do. OK. Well, I had to spend a bunch of mana to do it, but this attack is probably going to land. So remember, whenever I declare Chasm, it says target on it. So as I cast that spell and I use my three mana, I have to target a hex within two hexes. And I'm going to do that now. So let's say I target uh, this hex. And we, a lot of times, we'll use these markers just to mark that's the hex that got picked. Now, this hex, I can't target it. Because it's behind this white line, I can't see into the dome like that. So I'm going to have to target this hex that you're on. All right. OK. So now we go to the pass or play. You pass, you pass, I pass, you pass, we all pass. So then this is going to resolve. Target a hex within two hexes. I can still do that. I can still see the hex, which is rarely going to change. Push each hero adjacent to it one hex away from it. So in this case, adjacent in this game also includes the hex that you're on, right? So everything gets pushed one. So I'm going to push one. And when you're pushing away, it literally has to increase the hexes between you and the thing you're being pushed from. Yep. So I'll push this one away. Then I'll push you one away. And then 
We get another pass or play. Chasm has resolved, and we get another pass or play. I could put another thing on the stack. Ha! Ah! <laughs> but I don't have the mana. And assuming you don't, Time Warp now resolves, and so I would attach it, and I get to move one hex. Problem is, now I can't get out of this. So let's say I move here. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so then we go, and the attack is uh, attempting to resolve. Can it still target the hero? Well, Korjoff is not shapeshifted, so it's currently a ranged hero. So I can still target you. You're within three. You're not in a cover hex. So therefore, the attack resolves. I flip cards off the top, and you do, and we do the damage. Now, some wily stuff on that, right, is like if I had, uh, let's say, I push Korjoff here, and I push Shafathi here, now your time warp resolves into cover. I can no longer target you. That's right. So my attack would fizzle at that point, and I wasted one action point. So you can see how, as these things, the, the gameplay gets super interesting because you kind of, you have this big strategic overview that's happening. And then when you zoom into a moment, the tactics take over and you use the cards in your hand to declare what you're going to do. And you can get out of some weird situations. Absolutely. And you can get into some really bad situations, depending on the power cards that are played. And a few things worth noting. So you start the, the game, it's turn one, everyone has one resource. Uh, and you start with the active player. At the current time, both players start with six cards in their hand. That's right. And then that has changed from the original rules. Yep. Um, and then you first player chooses a hero to activate. After they activate, they exhaust. Second player chooses a hero to activate. They exhaust. You go back and forth. At the end of the round, uh, everything readies. All the cards that were attached after you've done all the checking for starting with lane one, then lane two, then lane three, um, control points, all that kind of stuff. All those cards go to your discard pile. Uh, then you get to draw two more cards. But right. There's a maximum hand size of six. So if you have more than six at that point, you have to choose cards to discard. Uh, and then you go to the second round. Yeah. And you stay the Everybody's first or second player mana. the whole time. Everyone now has two mana. You rinse and repeat. And you keep doing that until someone wins the game. That's correct. And notably, you can only cast these power cards during the heroes phase. So like when the minions are resolving, you don't have an opportunity to cast spells. When the outsider is doing their, their thing, you don't have an opportunity to cast spells. So it's just during the turn, the hero turn, where you actually are doing the back and forth, where those spells come in. And one thing that we didn't mention that is critical to the game is that when you actually defeat a hero and they go to zero health, they're removed from the board. So if you had led with that hero, that card just go, is just going to disappear. It's gone. They do nothing um, They're no longer counting their control point for that round. but. As importantly, when you defeat an enemy here, you get to draw two power cards. So the ways to get power cards, you get two at the end of the round. You get one if you destroy any number of towers in a turn. Uh, and technically, if you destroy a tower here and a tower here, you would get two cards That's from right, that. and that's a good turn. Yep. And then the other primary way is defeat an enemy hero. So if you defeat an enemy here, you get to draw two. Given that you only draw two a turn, two extra is actually very significant. It's super significant, especially if you're leading from hand a lot. Getting cards is really important. And then the last thing that we'll cover here with power cards is basically, well, who can use what cards, right? Very important to note. So let's pull up, uh, for instance, uh, Golbjorn is a, a good example here. A crazy bear person. Um, so Golbjorn, you'll notice there's the one element of the hero cards that we haven't discussed yet. And in the top of the card, you'll see there are two ruins there corresponding to what you've seen on the power cards themselves. There's a Talat green ruin, and there's a blue uh, Leothan ruin. And what this means is that Golbjorn, when you're casting a spell with Golbjorn, can cast spells that use blue mana, or can cast spells that use green mana, which I think I actually have some of. This is my blue and yellow. You have a green spell, don't you? Yes, it's an ultimate, but you'll get the, the idea. That's a good, we'll cover that too. So you can cast green spells or blue spells because Gol Golbjorn has a green icon and a blue icon. Yep. Now, Astrida, on the other hand, can cast blue spells or yellow spells. So whatever hero is casting has to have the matching icon on that hero card. And that's really important, right? So make sure that whenever you're trying to cast a spell, the spell that you're trying to cast has to match the ruins that are on the hero that's casting that yep, spell. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Zach, you mentioned a special thing called ultimates. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and pull up uh, Caged Soul here. And you'll notice something special about this power card particularly. Beyond the fact that it's got three mana on the top left and the plus three on the That's top right. That's a lot right, of numbers. Really That's good. big. Uh, you'll actually see Miyuki's art uh, up top in the middle, a little circle with her face in it. And this is what's called an ultimate. And so these are, these are kind of like the fatality moves of Mortal Kombat, right? The signature plays. Um, and the 
biggest restriction here is that the only hero that can play an ultimate is that hero. Right. And typically, these are going to be the most profound, powerful effects. They cost three, so you can't really play them until turn three. Uh, but they do big, game-breaking effects, and it's supposed to be like a momentous you know, moment, a, a big moment it's in the game. That's what this hero generally is all about, right? Yeah. So you can cast your ultimates only using the heroes that actually have their little picture on that ultimate. If you run out of deck, you reshuffle everything and just keep going. Yep. Um, the game flows super, super smooth, and you'll have your hand of cards. That's kind of your tactical spells. You'll take your strategic moves on the board. Your opponent might try to mess with you as you, as you lay out your ultimate plans. And then the way that you kind of construct your army is not just the heroes that you're bringing, but also the cards you're including in your deck. Now, you can include any cards in the deck that you want. Just remember, just remember that even though a card might be included with a particular hero, that they have to have that matching ruin to actually cast that spell, right? So whenever you're building a deck, you bring six heroes, typically, is the idea. And each hero brings one ultimate, so their ultimate. So Golbjarn would bring Golbjarn's ultimate, Ixitas would bring Ixitas' ultimate. And then that hero has seven cards attached to it. And you can have any, any card you want, even if they don't match the ruin of the hero that uh, you're bringing them with. So you bring eight cards with each hero, one ultimate, and seven of your choice. And then when you're drafting your heroes at the start of the game, you do like a one, two, two, one kind of situation. And when you draft a hero, you add the cards to your, your ultimate deck, to like your main deck. Yep. So a lot of the times that'll look like this. So let's say I've got cards here, cards here, I've got Golbjorn here, I've got Ixitas here, and I've got six of these heroes lined up. So I start, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm bringing Ixitas to the, to the party. And you have to put them next to your Nexus when you draft Spawn them in the Nexus, and I'm gonna add these eight cards to my deck, right? And then Zach drafts one or two, and then I draft one. And typically, it's so if you were a first player, it'd be one, then I do two, then you do two, then I do my last two, then you do your last one. And my last one, yeah. yeah. So then I add this to the deck, and then let's say, oh, Akla's, I, I want to bring Akla in here too, because I think I want an assassin in this one. So I draft Akla, I add that to the deck, and once I have my fourth hero, I've added those cards to the deck. Now I shuffle this up. That's your deck. I draw my opening hand, yeah. and any hero can cast any spell as long as it matches the ruins but only heroes that have their portrait on an ultimate can cast that ultimate. Yeah, and the, the first time, I, it was really the magical moment for me when I deck built for the first time. Because deck building where you're building eight or six little decks, and then basically you can respond to your opponent by what they're drafting, but that's ultimately shaping what your deck is and understanding the synergies from the various characters that you have. Um, it's really, as you've probably gathered if you're this far into this video, uh, it's they nothing here is overly complex. No, but the amount of nuance and decision and important choices and meaningful choices you make throughout this game from the get-go when you're drafting and deck building uh, to the actual gameplay decisions are are just incredibly meaningful. And I think it's very good game design. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this live tutorial. Hope it worked out for you. This is kind of what we would do if you walked into our store and said, "I want to learn SkyTier." We'd say, "Well, let, let us tell you about it because we're absolutely in love with it." Um, we appreciate you being here, and if you want to get involved, if you have rules questions, if you just want to kind of scope the game out, if you're trying to kind of figure out if this is right for you, check out the SkyTier Discord. That is 100% the best place to be. Check out uh, the Living Rules. You can find that on the PvP Geeks web website. Play SkyTier, I believe, is the, uh, the URL of that. Uh, and just get involved, right? There's a big tabletop simulator community right now because of COVID-19. The goal is to get this in retail stores, have tournaments going on, have organized play. They've got some good organized play kits. Uh, so we just can't, can't express how much we really love this game. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope you now know how to play. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. We'll be happy to answer or check out the rule book. I was going to say, whether it's now or many years into the future, if you have any questions, just leave a comment. We'd be happy to answer it. We think this game is great. And uh, we'll probably be playing it for years to come. So there's, at, no matter when you're watching this, even now uh, in 2020, we've done a whole bunch of streams where we're playing this game and exploring it and learning ourselves how to navigate through deck building and, and how to play the game. So if you are looking for more content, we have plenty of it, and we, we can't recommend it enough. That's right. So, hey, until next time, keep playing.